Okay, it's a little after 8. Apologize for getting started late. Um, we were waiting on one other commissioner to show up. He should be here in just a few minutes. Um, call to order the March 29th Salina City Commission special meeting. Uh, today's a very important day in the city of Salina, and it's going to be a long day, but it's, it's going to be a very important and exciting day for us. Uh, first of all, I would ask city staff for confirmation of the Kansas Open Meeting Act. Uh, required notice has been properly dispersed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can we have a roll call? Mayor Hoppick. Here. Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Lankowitz. Commissioner Longbine. Here. Commissioner Ryan. Here. Thank you. Will those who are able please stand for a pledge of allegiance and a moment of silence? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to City Manager Michael Scragg and let him get us started. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. As you mentioned, this is a big day and it's going to be a long day. Uh, appreciate your commitment to that and hopefully your patience will uh, prevail throughout the day. Um, I, I don't want to go into infinite detail in terms of process, but I want to touch on a few things as uh, kind of a reminder. As you well know, we uh, were lucky enough to secure $25 million of state funding. Uh, we've been through quite a process in terms of trying to solicit developer interest, uh, direct negotiations, and in conversation with the, the Kansas Department of Commerce. They requested that we uh, conduct a request for proposal process or a competitive selection process. We, we've done that. We uh, distributed RFPs. Uh, we had a, a process that we uh, outlined and went over with you in, in December uh, in advance of sending out the RFPs. Uh, that included an evaluation committee made up of, of staff and our financial advisors. So I do want to be sure to acknowledge them and make introductions. So they, that team was myself as the city manager, Jacob Wood is the deputy city manager, Sean Hennessy, assistant city manager, Lauren Driscoll, director of community development services, Debbie Pack, the finance director, and Matt Webster, who's with our financial advisor, Stiefel Nicholas. Um, I believe you met Matt by via Zoom, but I think this is his first time here in person. So. Um, Matt's been instrumental in assisting us with uh, putting the process together and, and the RFP process as well. As, as you, as we've discussed previously, um, I think it's more typical for a community to own a piece of property and solicit redevelopment proposals on it. We didn't find ourselves in that situation, um, and so our RFP process was a little unique in that we articulated uh, the desired outcome of, of multifamily units in response to uh, the creation of 500 jobs in the community and ask the respondents to identify and, and uh, secure locations and propose projects. So part of what you'll see today are varying locations and varying statuses of, of uh, securing those properties. Uh, and then additionally, um, I think our process is, as I've described it previously, a little bit unwieldy in that uh, we are conducting it uh, very openly, very transparently, subject to the Kansas Open Meetings Act. And so um, we, the staff review has taken place to get us to this point in terms of receiving those initial proposals. We received 13, which is a terrific indication of, of interest in, in development in the community. We narrowed that field to seven for interviews. Um, um, the original intended uh, process was the evaluation committee would come forward with a recommended developer to then enter into uh, development agreement negotiations with. Those negotiations would be uh, executive session uh, eligible and, and that discussion presumably uh, would go back and forth in terms of um, deliberation on your part in the executive session. Um, but the, the, the change in approach at your request was that we bring multiple presenters to you and to present and give you an opportunity to deliberate on them. So that's that's how we find ourselves where we are today. Uh, in all honesty, uh, you, you suggested that we bring forward three. 
Uh, as I previously said, we said we were going to interview five, and we interviewed seven. You asked for three, we brought you four. Um, and just kind of looking at how the, the proposals broke and wanting to, to give you and the developers an opportunity to uh, present kind of the, the field that, that uh, we identified. So we have a full day ahead of us. I did uh, provide to you, and we distributed as part of the packet, some of the communication leading up to this point and, and, and in terms of a cover memo from me. Um, the RFP itself, which is a pretty voluminous document when you factor in the housing study and some of the attachments that we provided. And then we had multiple communications to uh, developers to, to get to this point um, in terms of notice uh, of the interview process and, and how it would take place and then request for information. So I took the liberty of excerpting two particular pages out of that all that documentation and uh, giving you uh, copies of that on, on colored paper. It's the same information that was in, in that original distribution, but I thought it might help in, in all of this paperwork for you to find that back, myself as well. Um, and I won't read them to you in their entirety, but do want to touch on them a little bit. So the first one, and uh, I would call this salmon colored, but I'm shade colorblind, so whatever, whatever color you want to call this, um, is, a, is a memo that went out to the developers and it provided some instructions about uh, the format today and what it is that we were asking them to present to you. So you'll see there that we asked them to prepare a 25 minute presentation <clears throat> where they have the floor and, and they make that presentation and then we'll uh, begin questions and answers. Um, and we articulated in great detail 11 things that, that we particularly wanted them to be sure to, to address. And so that starts at the bottom of, of that page, uh, the front page, and carries over to the second page. That corresponds closely, if not identically, to the RFP uh, contents that we initially requested and the evaluation criteria that's been used throughout. And so um, I, I'll finish my comments here, and then if you have any questions about any of those, we'd be certainly happy to take those. Um, then the yellow sheet is um, some discussion of those evaluation criteria. Um, just some talking points for you or, or some uh, a, a elaboration on those criteria. So. And they are somewhat in what I would say would be priority order as we look at proposals. Obviously, it's uh, up to you how you um, want to uh, consider them. But experience uh, is key. Uh, you know, as we know, we developed, dealt with a developer for quite some time that, that had a vision, that, and that vision um, was the starting point for some conversations. And, and uh, But we never could get across the finish line. So experience in terms of completing a project and the ability to do that is, is certainly important, especially in light of the timeline that we're on with the state funds. Uh, the approach and methodology, I know we've had a lot of conversation, a lot of interest on your part and the public's part about rent rates, but there's much more that goes into that than just the rent rates. <clears throat> Again, um, you know, kind of lessons learned, uh, the ability to secure equity and, and capital investment and lending, and then the accuracy of, of, of their financial performa. Um, you know, we, we want to have some confidence going in that their, their numbers are reasonable and, and accurate so that uh, we all can deliver the, the intended finished product. Um, then we identified approach and methodology for design and construction. That gets into you know, the, the nuts and bolts of the project itself, the, the location, the infrastructure impacts on our system, uh, site design and layout, and then the proposed product in terms of construction, layout, aesthetics. Uh, dura long-term durability. I know some of the, the, some of those things are things that you've articulated in prior conversations, uh, and then their demonstrated uh, ability to deliver the products as proposed, and then and the level of, de of detail to cause confidence in their, their cost estimating. Um, site and property control, uh, location itself uh, is going to vary, and, and I think that's a consideration that you've um, brought up previously. And then uh, the status of property control, um, it lends itself to the ability to hit the ground running and, and, and move the project forward. Project schedule, uh, we've asked for details on the project schedule. Um, one thing that's come out of the conversations with uh, some of the respondents as well as community conversations is uh, not only just the timing to complete the project, but if there is phasing and the developer's um, intent and commitment to build 500 units um, and whether they're committed on the front end or whether they're uh, 
uh, are proposing a lesser amount and then uh, reassessment somewhere along the line. And then we included a, a category that we titled scope alternatives, recognizing there may be some, some uniqueness or something innovative that, that was proposed. And frankly, one of the considerations that's been in the conversation for quite some time is redevelopment of a blighted site versus infill development. Uh, financially, I don't know that the, those numbers are going to balance out, and that uh, gives you the opportunity to place some priority on um, things other than just the, the cost if there's other elements that that uh, are priorities for you. Um, you know, the the Drever project um, was proposing the ambassador recognizing that that acquisition and demolition was was above and beyond greenfield site cost. We didn't we didn't make that a requirement of the proposal. We didn't make that a priority of the proposal. We just uh, created that scope alternatives category to kind of broadly allow for some some comparison of any innovation that developers or proposers might have. Um, so other things to bear in mind that, that I called out in the in that cover memo is. Um, we're really here to hear the presentations from the, the developers. Um, we're, we're not here to negotiate the alternatives or negotiate a preferred outcome or, or modifications to the proposal. Um, I, I, I expect uh, if you ask anyone that's before you right now wanting to secure your, your uh, approval, uh, they're going to be inclined to say yes. We really need to hear their proposal, their intention as they present it, and then at the point that we identify a selected proposer, we can start to work on term sheets and a development agreement and work those details through um, with you. Um, so uh, practically speaking, the intent is identify one. Um, the, you'll see that there is a developer that, that has multiple sites and and kind of a team that they brought together, but the intent is not to try to simultaneously negotiate with multiples of the presenters you see today. Um, that's just un uh, further uh, complicates it and, and not very practical. Um, and then additionally, um, we've told all the other respondents they they're, they've not been eliminated from com from the conversation or from consideration. We'll work through these um, if. It turns out that we uh, think that we need to look at others. We certainly can can make that happen as well. Um, you're not making a final decision today, nor part of this step of the process. Um, it, it's an identification of who you'd like to um, enter into negotiations with, um, and I guess that's a, as good a place as any to talk about uh, where we might end up today. And honestly, I don't entirely know. Um, the we've talked about the we've left open the possibility if if you uh, come to consensus to uh, provide direction on who you'd like to enter into negotiations with, but I fully recognize that's that's a pretty tall order. We have not provided you any of the uh, proposals, written proposals, uh, out of um, uh, fairness and objectivity to all the the presenters and not wanting to start a conversation in advance of everyone having kind of the being in the starting blocks with their presentation today. So you are hearing these cold. Um, uh, staff recognizes that, and so I expect we're going to need to get through that fourth presentation, and then you'll have to size up your level of comfort and how you'd like to pr proceed from there. Um, today is Wednesday. Tomorrow is packet day. So you know, if there's a, an expectation that deliberations are going to continue, I don't know that staff's going to be able to turn it by next Monday. But w obviously, we want to get this right, and uh, we'll need to figure out how you want to proceed once we can uh, complete the presentations. Um, we have advised the presenters all the way throughout in writing as part of the RFPs and, and reminded them that ex parte communications are uh, a disqualifier. Um, is that important? That's probably my biggest concern if we extend the deliberations that uh, understandably um, individuals outside of the developers themselves may want to give you input. And from an ex parte communication standpoint, if, if you're getting that feedback, you really should avoid it, and if you receive any, you need to disclose it to the rest of the, the governing body so you're all working from a, a same basis of, of information. So that's probably the biggest concern about extending the deliberations. Um, understandably, you, you could have questions and ask staff to follow up on homework items and gather more information for you. Um, so at, the point, at this point, 
the, the immediate next steps would be to commence negotiations with the developer. Um, we have not done detailed financial reviews of, of the four that are presenting you, to you today. We would do that. We have enough uh, confidence to say that we don't see any major red flag or see any red flags that cause us concern. We, we just need to continue that financial due diligence. Uh, and then we begin um, uh, what you may be familiar with as a term sheet, kind of the, the major talking points of a development agreement. If we have a meeting of the minds there, then we can um, uh, turn that into a development agreement. And then I guess the last thing I have for you is um, we have identified outside counsel that specializes in this, um, but they'll need to do a, a, a conflicts check. And so at the point that we identify um, a selected developer to enter into negotiations with, we'll reach out to them, ask them to do a, a conflict check, and then we'll come back to you to recommend a, a specialized legal counsel to assist us with this process. So um, I think that's all I had in, in terms of preliminaries and want to give you an opportunity to, to ask any questions you might have. I'll start to my left. So we will have no handouts or packets. Uh, good question. Thank you. We yes, we asked them to provide um, their information in advance, and so Warren Driscoll has those, and she's printing them and distributing them um, as they present. So a couple of items that we've asked for are the presentation themselves, which I Lauren handed this out. Uh, okay. This morning, it, it corresponds with the first presentation. We also had some summary information, financial uh, summary information that we asked them to, to confirm and provide, and so uh, they'll be covering that in their presentations. We'll give that to you as each presentation is made as well. I didn't want to rely on my note taking. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Linkowitz. I have um, a little spreadsheet started here. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to uh, hit basis on the, uh, kind of where we came from, when we sent out the RFP, it's, it asked for a minimum of 250 in, in each proposal. Is that correct? Yeah, I think I think we actually took it to 150. Is it 150? Um, and there was a okay. there was a recognition that we may need to mix and match. Um, I think all the presenters uh, that will present to you today uh, have sp spoke to and have have a plan for 500. Um, or at least there we view them as it being in that range um, part of the conversation will be how they intend to get there okay. yeah. one, one question when you no go, go ahead, ahead. Uh, I'm assuming anything we receive today is going to be public information yes um, everything that you received from from staff in advance was posted like a packet and then the intention is that um, well a couple things we are not broadcasting this we are recording it and we'll, we'll um, make it available online but just uh, to not create a scenario where a proposer can w watch online they they could be in the room um, we did not tell them they couldn't but just trying to maintain that kind of a level playing field. So in answer to your question, yes, the, the presentations they make to you today will be public, and then the video of the meeting will be public. Right. And with respect to ex parte communication, uh, assuming we're all going to get comments on this in church or the grocery store or whatever, is the proper response to stand there and listen and say nothing or to say I can't discuss it? Um, <laughs> yeah, I was, was <laughs> going to turn to, to stop Greg talking. Bankson. I, the, the issue with ex parte communication is even if you listen and don't engage, if that is information that influences your decision and it's not available to the rest of the commissioners, um, that's, a, uh, that's not a full deliberation. The solution is disclosure of ex parte communications as a kind of last resort but that is problematic in general, let alone if you receive widespread feedback. Now, does that feedback uh, encompass only comments on behalf of a particular proposal, or is it just a citizen saying, well, you know, all these were great, but no one addressed uh, you know, swimming pools. I'll just make right. up something. Um, if, if it has any way of influencing your decision, the, that's something that you should be taking into consideration as a group. Because citizens see us as 
their conduit for I completely <laughs> understand. That's, what, that what's, that's yeah. what makes this process so unwieldy, um, and that's why we were – well, why we started down the path of bringing you a staff recommendation of one for you to consider just recognizing how difficult this can be. Okay. Thank you. And, and I guess to follow up on that, I've talked to uh, City Manager Scrag, and we, at the end of everything, usually take public comment. Um, I felt it best not to, just because until yesterday, it was, we didn't really know who the players were. I st we still maybe don't know who the developers are working with as far as on, on land purchases. So I think it's best that we don't take any public comment because there could be somebody trying to sway us towards a, a certain piece of property or developer that they would have a relationship with for some reason. So I just want to get that up front, uh, that that was a dis discussion that I've had with, with Mr. Scragg, and I think that's probably, that if idea. everybody is, uh, agrees with that. Yeah, that's so, a good idea. Thank you. I have one uh, quick question here. Are all the, we got a nice group of people here. Are all the presenters here in person, or will some be? Uh, Lauren, uh, do you know if we have any zooming in or what the attendance is going to look like? Okay. Yeah, and I do want to thank Lauren and her staff and all the city staff. A lot of work has went into this to get to this day, and uh, thank everyone for, for coming and being part of this. So I guess there's one recap item that I intended to cover earlier, but as staff has talked about the proposals and, and tried to weight them and, and prioritize them, I, I would characterize to you my summary of uh, kind of how we have been looking at it is who has the experience, the ability, and readiness to quickly build an acceptable product at an acceptable price point? And put another way, are they ready to hit the ground running, and are they free of obstacles, conditions, and, and distractions? Um, there's going to be, I, mean, I, I know just from some of the comments you've made previously as we were discussing this, there, there's a lot of interest in materials and formats and rent rates, and, and there's just going to be a lot uh, a lot of variables here, but um, at the end of the day, we we're looking for someone that can demonstrate that they can uh, build a, a product um, on our timeline. I also want to thank Commissioner Davis for putting this on the floor to have this, because as commissioners, we t right now we know nothing. <laughs> We've got four names here, and that's all we know. So. Well, after you go to the grocery store Saturday, you may not be thanking me. <laughs> don't go to the grocery store. store. Well, <laughs> middle of the afternoon, you might not right. be thanking me. <laughs> One other question. Um, when we applied for the money from the state, um, was that request made for housing to um, satisfy 500 jobs, or did we actually put in there that we were going to do 500 doors? I think there's a big distinction right. there based on some of the other things going the on. The language is actually in response to creation of 500 jobs. So it, it does not go so far as to say 500 doors. Okay. The general intent all along has been 500 units. Okay. Well, it looks like we're right, yeah, at, we're right, on right at 8.30. Yeah, um, so that's so I, I know we have a, a handful of people here. I'm going to call on, I think, Rob Heineman to uh, introduce the rest of his team and, and take it from here. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Commission. Appreciate the time. Staff, thank you for everything you've done to uh, support this process. Uh, my name is Rob Heineman. I'm the managing partner of 635 Holdings. We're really excited to be here. We think this is a, a wonderful project. We've assembled a team um, that has over 50 years of experience. We've done over a billion dollars worth of development in the state of Kansas. We've been involved in about $2 billion worth of public-private partnerships, have a lengthy list of people that you can talk to about, uh, we do what we say we're going to do. And to be honest, um, we initially heard about Salina, and I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about Salina. Um, but we've done our due diligence and have spent a lot of time here in the market, um, have spoken with a lot of different people, and are just incredibly excited about, about the opportunity here. 
because to us it doesn't look like something that's just a housing project. It looks like this is an opportunity to kind of set up a, an experience ecosystem and really do something that's long term in nature. And I guess when we kind of look at this project, to be honest, we don't look at it as a housing project. We look at it as a recruitment project. Um, you've done a great job in this community of establishing um, really some unbelievable employers. If you talk about Great Plains, Kubota, you know, Schwann's, uh, One Vision, everything that uh, Tim Rogers is doing at the airport authority, uh, the hospital, you know, the Walker family and everything they've done for the community, um, it's, it's really outstanding. Uh, you're punching well above your weight for probably the number of people that live in this community. And we kind of look at this very much akin to a project that we've been working on in Kansas City for about the last 20 years. So I, I was fortunate in 2005 to be a part of a group that bought the Kansas City Wizards, the professional soccer team in, in Kansas City. They're now called Sporting Kansas City today. And I did that with two gentlemen, uh, Neil Patterson and Cliff Illig, who were the founders of Cerner Corporation. And Cerner was at a point in its uh, lifespan that they were under tremendous pressure recruiting people to Kansas City. Uh, they were growing at an enormous rate. Most of their employees were tech people that were coming from the coasts, and they really thought that they needed to do something in Kansas City to kind of jumpstart uh, the experience economy, really kind of the live, work, play environment for their staff. And so one of the things that they did was they bought, bought the Wizards. They bought soccer. They bought uh, into the world's game because when they kind of looked across their employee population, they had people coming from, call it 40 plus countries around the world. And in most of those, soccer was kind of the world's game, the leading sport. And so they, they looked at it as a way to create a vision where a long-term plan where we'd invest in soccer, invest in lifestyle, invest in sports in Kansas City to try to assist them in kind of the recruitment phase. I think we see that here in, in Salina as well. This is a generational opportunity, the amount of money um, you know, that's been provided by, by you know, through ARPA um, is a once in a lifetime thing. And so for us, it's not how do we push that out and just build a bunch of apartments, it's how do we create kind of a context here that can live and breathe and grow upon itself over the course of the next 20 years. And so, you know, we're going to talk to you today about, you know, not only kind of the, the ARPA phase or the, what I'd call the RFP phase of this process, but also um, I think we believe star bonds are a, are, are a, a very useful tool here. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in over $400 million worth of star bond projects in the state of Kansas. Uh, I think there's an opportunity to, to build on the star bond deal that's been done here uh, previously by the Walker family um, to, you know, make sure that we do have the opportunity not only to, uh, you know, build apartments, build housing, but again, build experiences, whether it's, it's you know, outdoor fields, indoor facilities, uh, pools, whatever it might be, that support kind of the family unit and allow somebody that is coming from, you know, Kansas City, Denver, wherever it might be, uh, to work in, in the 2,000 jobs that we believe are gonna be created over the course of the next five to seven years here, here in Salina. Um, you know, we, like I mentioned, we've spoken with, with a number of the different constituents, whether it's the company CEOs and owners, uh, whether it's the chamber, um, lots of different needs, lots of different types of housing, lots of different, um, you know, price points, probably lots of different, you know, kind of household incomes that we're going to be working with. So to us, that said, this can't just be a cookie cutter where we go find a site and build 500 units. It's got to be a mix, and so we're going to talk to you today about three distinct sites that we've set up, um, two of which are in qualified opportunity zones. Um, that's an important thing, we believe, in allowing the economics to work around this project. Um, I think by the nature of using qualified opportunity zone financing around this, we're suggesting to you that we're going to be here for at least 10 years. It's a 10-year financing, and so that's the way that we're, we're approaching the project. Um, so to us, you've got a really strange and kind of interesting sort of set of economics here where you're ostensibly at full employment, right? So we've got to go figure out how to fill 2,000 jobs with nearly full employment, which means it's all about recruiting and bringing people here. So that is why um, we've been kind of thoughtful around you know some of these other amenities when we talked uh, with uh, tim rogers about schwann's he said they've got a real um, daycare issue so we've proposed as as part of our project that we'll we'll build a daycare 
Um, when we talk to um, you know Jimmy Sponder, he's got a real issue around temporary workers that are coming in and him not having you know good extended stay accommodations and or even a spot for a guy pulling an RV or trailer um, you know to, to have a good solution for that when they're here for whatever it may be 30 or 40 days so that that's that's kind of the way that we're we're approaching this project like I said I, I think we've done uh, a lot of due diligence we've met with a lot of different people on a lot of different things I think for us it's about housing it's about recreation uh, we have been working with Tim Rogers a lot around some different things I think we can do on the aviation side inside of the, the airport authority. So we look at this as a, a really interesting kind of um, melting pot of opportunity for us to build on. Um, I think this is something that we want to sink our teeth into for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years and figure out how we can, you know, do something really special together. Um, I've got a great team here. Uh, we aren't a team that has been together for 20 years doing a ton of projects. We all have done a lot of projects. We all have known each other and worked together on a number of different occasions. Uh, but I think that's important for how we want to approach this. We don't want to just be singular in nature. We want to be multifaceted and be more of a, a Swiss Army knife for you um, than just a single blade. So um, I'm going to introduce former uh, Speaker of the House Ron Reichman, who's part of our team. Just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the, the ARPA funds, and then we'll follow up with uh, some additional detail on, on our project. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Ron Reichman, 635 Holdings. You know, when the um, city manager mentioned that you were lucky enough to get $25 million, it's quite, I would not, I almost disagree with that statement. Um, it wasn't luck. It wasn't by accident. Uh, the state notices what you guys have done, the way you work together uh, with, the, with the county, with economic development councils, uh, with airport authority. Um, again, to bring these type of businesses to this town that actually need to keep hiring, um, it's, it's remarkable. And so we know that it's not by accident. Uh, that's the vision that you guys have set forward. It's the way you, the staff you've hired, the way you work with them. And so when you come to the state of Kansas or you come and talk to a SPARC commission and, and you're able to ask for these type of uh, resources, it's easy to invest because you're a proven commodity. And it's something we'll look back 10, 15 years from now and go, wow, we had a part of that. And so Rob asked me to be on this <coughs> side of it. I was extremely excited because I kind of want to know how you guys do this. Um, love to see you guys build a bottle up, the way you communicate, work together, because it's not by accident, and take it to other places in the state. Um, I know you guys are focused on Salina and Sling County, and you guys are doing a tremendous job. But we, again, thank you for the opportunity. No, you're not here by accident. Um, this is uh, so it was very it's very meaningful. Um, it's it's on purpose, and I congratulate you on that. And I look forward to working with you. Good morning. My name's uh, Bob Becker. I am the uh, president of uh, Luke Drayley Construction at Riverside, Missouri. Uh, we've finished over the past five years uh, about $500 million worth of uh, uh, multifamily projects in Kansas City. So uh, Rob and I and team hooked up. Anyway, I'm going to be a part of the, uh, I'm going to be running all the design and construction. So we wanted to elaborate a little bit on what we're proposing to build in Salina. So, Here's a project in uh, Lee Summit, Missouri. It's called Residence of Echelon. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Lee Summit. Anyway, that's uh, a 243-unit project. Uh, typical floor plates, about uh, 24 units per building. You're looking at a uh, stone, not, not on the slide, but it's a uh, stone veneer and James Hardy board siding. Anyway, some of the finishes uh, that we're proposing would be uh, quartz or granite countertops, uh, uh, plywood cabinets, and with the particle, uh, particle board cabinets, uh, LVT living areas, uh, carpet and bedrooms. You can, this anyway, this kind of gives you an idea what uh, some of the finishes would look like. Paige, we flip to the next slide, please. Um, this is a uh, senior living community in uh, Prairie Village, Kansas, called uh, Mission Chateau. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that but um, anyway 
similar concept, uh, granite or quartz countertops, uh, BLVT flooring, uh, the nice pendant lighting above the uh, uh, kitchens, what have you. Um, anyway, so these are kind of considered really a, uh, a, a class A class A minus uh, garden style apartments, okay? Um, anyway, enclosed stairwells, what have you. What we're proposing, uh, next slide please. So this is gonna be typically what we're gonna build uh, for the multifamily. That building right there, if you look at it, it's a three level. Uh, you've got eight units per floor. They're one to two bedrooms units. Uh, you're looking at a stone veneer on the first 10 to 12 feet. And then we're looking at doing a uh, James Hardy board cement siding versus just a typical vinyl lap siding, which you've got more options. You can do a lot of things with, last longer and what have you. Um, so that's, that's what you're gonna see phase one. And I'll let Rob dive into phase one and two and what have you, but um, that's, uh, that's a 24 unit building. Uh, we're looking at uh, building 240 units, minimum of that product right there. So, um, next slide, and I'll let Alex get dive into more of this. This is uh, another product we're looking at building also. I believe this is a, a 10 unit uh, uh, complex too. So, anyway, any questions for me in regards to construction materials, type of construction, construction time? What did you say the cabinets were made out of? I so there'll be so there'll be a shaker style cabinet that's uh, out of plywood versus most of these cabinets are particle board that you'll yeah, see. Uh, you said both, and so I wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Alex Howe, but yeah, just to re reiterate what Rob and Bob have said, we're here. Uh, next slide, sorry. As well. Um, one more. Um, to re reiterate what Bob and Rob have said, um, we're focused on the long-term viability of the project and overall the capital stack is really where that begins and ends. So um, if we go to our sources and uses page, um, we um, will show that we're using qualified opportunity zone dollars um, that Rob had referenced um, to help capitalize this project. And then the second part of that is um, where's the debt financing gonna come from? And so rather than go um, take out as much leverage on the front end, we've uh, take a prudent approach and size this for stabilized debt on the back end. Um, and so in doing that, um, we've really eliminated any sort of capital call situations or situations where the debt of the property is um, taking, uh, it imp negatively impacting the current operations at the property level. Um, phase one, as you can see, is 100% residential, um, and phase two is where um, the Starbon projects come in um, that Rob referenced earlier. And so we have in the Starbonds, we have that RV park, the sports complex, and then in phase one, um, we're able to accomplish all 500 units. Um, as a part of the, the housing RFP. Um, next slide. And then rental rates. Um, we started the whole uh, meeting talking a lot about rental rates and um, we're gonna build a market leading product like Rob and Bob have both referenced. And so it's difficult to comp out. Um, I'm sure everybody in the room had a challenging time really identifying what we could do with rents. And so we took a unique approach and really dug into the demographics of the city of Salina and um, other similar type communities across the state of Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri. And um, we overlaid some demographic data from ArcGIS and census track data. And what we found was, um, especially in the West Magnolia site, that 90 percent uh, or those lo that locations in the 90th percentile for both daytime population and retail sales so it's clear that people are spending a ton of time there and they're spending a ton of money there but it's only in the 20th percentile for um, area median income in your in your metro and so 
um, we took that information and really realized that this is an opportunity to go build some quality housing for workers in these areas. Um, it's where they're spending their time, it's where they're spending their money. And so next step is let's get some housing for these folks. And so um, as far as rental rates, that really backed us into um, about just under $1,200 a month um, when you take the net effective across our entire uh, unit mix. And part of that is based upon the um, area median household income of just under $60,000 for the city of Salina. So we want to make sure um, we're at a rental rate that these people can go home, enjoy their time, but they can also go spend money in your community and be able to partake in dinner with friends, um, a happy hour, and those types of things, and they're not stuck at home because they can't afford to go spend money in the community. They're spending it all on their rent. Paige, can you take it back to the uh, slide that's got the overview, the, the three site overview on it? Yeah, this one. Um, so again, we, we talked about the fact that we're gonna utilize three sites. Um, and let me kind of talk to you about those sites. So, so the first site, what we refer to as West Magnolia A, um, is probably the first mover site. That, that's where we initially would do, you know, 240 to 250 units, as, as kind of Bob described. Um, that is in a qualified opportunity zone. Uh, it's adjacent to Menards there, so likely this is an area that we would also try to entitle with a Starbond district at some point. Um, just it, adjacent to this is... Is that west of Menards? Yeah, west of Menards, correct. Uh, just west of that site, across the tree line, is what we're referring to as One Vision Floodplain. That's a site that's owned by, by Jimmy Sponder. Uh, we've talked to him about that. That's a site that we believe that we would build um, an athletics park and probably a park. So, you know, think of trails, frisbee golf, dog park, things like that. Uh, in collaboration with Sporting Kansas City, we'd be building a soccer complex there. Uh, that Sporting Kansas City would operate on that. We think the nature of, of their involvement in that will help us with the star bond approval. Um, we have spoken to the Lieutenant Governor at length specifically about this and feel that he's gonna look very favorable upon Salina for a project like that. And that's excellent ground for it. It's floodplain, it's obviously not, you know, something that's gonna be utilized for other development. And so I, I think our vision there is we do both kind of soccer complex, multi-field complex obviously could be used for lacrosse and other things. And I think we do a baseball complex as well. And there's probably a good spot because there's plenty of acreage that that's where we would do a, an RV park, probably a luxury RV park, uh, which is kind of a, it's sort of a hot asset class in, in real estate development these days. But we think that fits um, you know, Jimmy's needs pretty effectively. So that's, that's kind of site A. Um, I think probably trailing that site just by a little bit is Third Street, um, uh, which is you know land that's controlled by the Walker family. I think we want to think through how we're going to master plan that. I think for, for this phase, what we're telling you is that we do kind of 44 garden style units at that site. Uh, again, that's in a qualified opportunity zone. But you know, having spoken with the Walker family and other kind of city constituents, <laughs> Um, this whole notion of kind of a, a river district or river walk or river project, I think that's intriguing to us. And so I, I think the housing that we do down here, we wanted to respond to that. If that is a long-term plan and a long-term vision, I think we want to figure out how we can incorporate that to create kind of the best pedestrian experience. We know that these units are needed probably sooner rather than later for the hospital based on some discussions that we've had. They just have a real shortage around housing for, for nurses. So, so it's something that you know, we want to be purposeful and, and design in the right way, but we know we kind of got to get going on that because it's a need. Um, and then the third site is Cortland Circle, which is probably the best piece of real estate. Um, it's not in a qualified opportunity zone. Um, we've obviously had a lot of discussions with uh, Mr. Hall and Mr. Applequist about this site. Um, you know, I think the type of development that we're going to do there probably initially would be a senior product. And then there's probably a product that we'd follow up with that's more two and three bedrooms that would, would probably be more appropriate kind of for their, their expat, expat population. But again, we kind of got to think through that a little bit as we sort of get into, get into the weeds here. But, but three distinct sites for us. Um, obviously, the Cortland Circle site, we're only proposing 108 units on that. It's, it's a 
huge site. I mean, we could do 500 units on that site. So it's sort of the site that if things are going well and over time, our absorption looks like the way that we think it can based on, you know, kind of where these incomes are. Um, Cortland's a spot that we could wind up doing substantially more over time, but, but as kind of phase one, because it's not a qualified opportunity zone, it's probably the smallest of the three sites. Um, as it relates to site control, we have, you know, a contingent contract on West Magnolia A. We've also spoken to a landowner on, um, you know, West Magnolia, what we call B, which is just next to it. It's just kind of down and to the right from where A sits. So we understand that we could control that if we needed to or wanted to. Had numerous discussions with Jimmy Sponder on the One Vision floodplain. So we know that there's a, we don't have a contract on that. Um, we don't necessarily have a price, but we think there's a quote unquote partnership opportunity more around that than probably just an acquisition of land. And similar to Cortland Circle, like I said, we've had numerous discussions with landowner, uh, Mr. Applequist, and, and we know there's a, a deal there. And again, I don't know if that deal would be a straight purchase or if it'd be some sort of a partnership, contribution of land, we don't know. But I would say that, you know, we've had discussions and, 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 and same with the Walker family on downtown. I mean, we've had numerous discussions with them. There actually could be some opportunity with other pieces of adjacent land to that site to do more. So I think we feel like we're in good shape with all them as it relates to our ability to control that land if we're successful in, in receiving kind of the, the approvals. Um, financial strength and access to capital. Uh, we're a self-funded entity. We have a fund of our own. Uh, so we won't be going to the market for any equity. We have our own qualified opportunity zone capital, so we won't be going to the market for that. Um, you know, debt is, you guys know the world we're living in right now, so, so debt's always going to be um, a challenge. Um, we have great banking relationships. You know, right now we've got over $400 million worth of construction underway in Kansas City. Uh, have great banking relationships around all that. So our ability to go uh, obtain debt, I think, is is strong. But again, it's, you know, rates are crazy right now. So obviously that's that's going to be something that, that will be a process that we'll have to work through around all this. Um, and then Starbond financing. And, and again, I just want to be clear, we're, we're not saying that, you know, we have to get a Starbond district or we're not doing this deal. That's That's not it at all. The RFP stands on its own, and we think that project stands on its own. But we think our ability to go get a Starbond district approved is unique. Um, you know, I, I would say that we probably have received more Starbonds than, than any other entity uh, in the state. Like I said, we've had discussions at the state level specifically about this already. Um, I have, the speaker has as well. We've both spoken to the lieutenant governor. So I, th I think we feel very confident in that. Um, and there's things about that, those star bonds that I think are just going to enhance, that would all be around sort of the destination amenities. So like the sporting soccer park, baseball fields, that's what we'd be utilizing those for. And again, maybe somehow that plays into the river district as well. We try to do one kind of non-contiguous site star bond project. So again, that's something that we just need to dig into more. But we will be in front of you with it relatively quickly with kind of a plan and sources and uses because we do think it's something that could be accre incredibly accretive to the project and additive. Um, so, so that's something that, that is important to us to, to work on for sure. Can we go to the wrap up slide at the end? Um, one more, please. I kind of see I'm running short on time, so I wanted to get to this. But so one thing that I should touch on that as we flip through there, um, you know, again, when we say it's a recruitment project, another one of the projects that we've been working on kind of behind the scenes here in collaboration with the speaker is uh, an income tax holiday for employees under the age of 30. And so we think something like that, again, in this whole vein of recruitment approach and, and trying to make sure that we can do something where we can attract people to Salina, uh, we think there's a, an opportunity for us to create that where, you know, new jobs created or new people coming into the community could have an income tax holiday until the age of 30, um, which, which we think would be attractive and, and something that would help. Um, you know, I guess in summary, again, just we, we want to do everything we can to improve kind of the live, work, play environment here in Salina. It's such a cliche, but it's, you know, that experience economy is something that we've worked on forever. We've been successful in, you know, over $2 billion worth of projects, creating things like that all across this country. 
Um, again, we think that trying to take sort of a set of whole context that allows us to recruit these 2,000 people that we believe are going to be showing up within the next whatever it is, three, five, seven years is important. So having, you know, high quality of life amenities, you know, good so social environments, things like that, that's something that we think is really key as we're putting this all together. Um, we didn't want to just do a cookie cutter approach. We wanted to make sure that we looked at the multiple constituents across this community and do varied types of products in different locations and also give us opportunity for growth in a number of different locations as well. And then again, we do believe that, that the opportunity to do a Starbond district here over time um, is gonna be important and is gonna allow us to really fulfill kind of this, this promise and obligation that we're making to you here that is we wanna make Salina uh, an even greater place than it is and have it be sort of a, a spot that people want to come work in these great jobs that you've done so um, such a good job in fostering these these companies that are here so with that looks like five four three two one uh, appreciate it happy to answer any questions that you have and thanks so much for the time okay thank you I'm guessing this stirred a few questions so uh, i'm going to start to my left uh mr davis do you have some Oh, right. uh, I'm sure I'll get more of the day going on. Uh, for the villas, I'm sorry, this is not on, sorry. For the uh, villas, are parking garages anticipated? I just noticed you on the talk pictures, about the product. none of these had uh, garages. Yeah, so they would be detached garages, um, but we don't have attached garages in that construction format that we've proposed there. All right. And and as far as the proposed star bond, is that something <laughs> that becomes part of your original proposal now, or is that something you envision as an add-on? Yeah, it's, it's a secondary of the scope piece. Of this? Yeah, uh, the, the RFP stands on its own, and, and it's, it's a project that we think is viable regardless of star bonds. Uh, we just think star bonds are incredibly viable here and we're confident that we can go achieve it so it's something that we would work on and and it would be parallel path so we would be back in front of you and the state relatively soon after receipt of the rfp to try to start to establish the star bond district thank you that's all for right now mr ryan i have none yeah i'll go this direction so the star bonds is, would be kind of the icing on the cake yeah absolutely okay i'd like to drill down a little bit uh, more on your locations sure uh third street that would be third and mulberry by the park yes okay and 44 units there so that'd be a pretty small development so I, th I think, um, I, I don't mean to cut you off there, but I, I do believe there are other adjacent pieces of property there that, that we feel that we would likely go <coughs> consolidate. So I don't, I don't think we would just wind up at the end of the day doing 44 units. I think vis-a-vis -vis the RFP, we would, we would build 44 units there, but I think we would try to control a larger landmass there. And again, like I said, if we could incorporate it into the river project yeah, um you yeah. know that's something that we'd like to look at as well that would entail negotiating with the school district on their property correct yes uh Cortland circle that interests me is that can you drill down on that location is that where uh sunflower uh, bank the big sunflower okay, bank is right. located right there on the on the corner um so it's it's a great piece of property uh, you know the well graded it's got utilities to the site um you know great kind of traffic patterns around there so so yeah it's it's a site that i think we would look at not only for housing but there's probably commercial that we develop on the frontage there as well and it would probably be commercial call it restaurant entertainment that would support the housing project behind it so i think that, that's how we'd look at that over that time that would be directly east of sunflower bank correct yeah and, and again i think we would put that Again, in, in kind of the Starbond world, a non-contiguous Starbond project, we would probably try to put that dirt in the Starbond project okay. as well. Okay, and uh, the One Vision floodplain, I, can you? <laughs> so hard to see a developer coming in and put floodplain in their description. Yeah, well, I, you know, having developed 
oh, what, 120 soccer fields, athletic fields in the Kansas City metro area, a lot of them are in floodplain because it's, it's land that, you know, you know, obviously you're not going to build anything that requires, you know, any structure. And so it's useful land for, for doing development like that. So um, that's, that's what we would do. And some of it's floodway, and we're not going to build in the floodway, but in the floodplain we can. And for things like restrooms and concessions, you just build them up. You, you know, build a three-foot base and you put your concession restroom buildings on those. Uh, and we've been successful doing that. We did that with Kansas City, Missouri Parks and Recs down in Swell Park, if you've ever been. Not you know, to been interpret to his question, but I think maybe what he's trying to ask is there's no apartments being built in the floodplain or the floodway. That's those correct. Are the, those are the recreational That's piece correct. Of, yep. of the star bond or whatever. Yeah, all, all the apartments, right. all the housing on that site is on what we refer to as West Magnolia A, which is to the east, you know, right. in, in between sort of the tree line and Menards. And this one vision would be directly west of the creek. That's right. So there likely would be a pedestrian bridge that would kind of connect the two sites. So, you know, hopefully over time you'd have 400 plus kind of housing units on the east and pedestrian bridge with a nice sort of park and athletic complex to the west. That would work nice if we get funding for uh, improving Magnolia Road. So a Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I know that's a that's an expensive project. I want right. to say it's a 15 or 20 million dollar project. OK, right. thank you. Sure. And Commissioner, it's not out of the question, too, that that if we did do a star bond district, that that road project wouldn't be a use, you know, that we would use that source for. Uh, we would have the ability to do that. And that's something that we could push commerce on to try to see if we could get some KDOT funds or something as part of the star bond deal. Could I ask a yep. connected ahead, question yep. uh, to Mr. Hyman and perhaps Mr. Scrake? With that type of development on West Magnolia trigger an automatic need for an upgrade, much like Holmes Road now. Yeah, traffic volume certainly would uh, become a consideration, both in terms of road improvement as well as possibly signals and traffic control. So um, we you know, we've anticipated the need for that, but something like this would certainly heighten that need. But it wouldn't necessarily be tied. Would not be a responsibility of the developer to upgrade the road. Yeah, we don't currently require perimeter road. In, well, we do have perimeter road standards, but uh, we've not required developers to make those full improvements. We have the interim road standards, and then we have the full road standards. So we'd have to take a look at where they adjoin Magnolia and, and its condition. Okay. Commissioner, I'd say to you what what's really important to us around any of these experiential things that we do is the guest experience and arrival and and. Uh, exit sequence are always a really big thing around that. You know, parents don't like sitting in their car waiting to get into the ball fields. Uh, so we would take that as we, we want to make sure the guest experience is good. So if that requires some offsite improvements, that's something that we would put as part of our overall plan. Thank you. Okay. I guess I have I have several questions looking at your charts um, and from from this uh, what you had previously stated the phase one multifamily um, you use your source of funds so you'd be using the full 25 million from that we have from the state plus the thousand I say 25,000 that wouldn't go very <laughs> far would it how about 25 million yeah, okay um, and then the million from the county the million from the the city um, what was the total number of units that was going to be in the phase one, which would be on Magnolia? Um, so phase one includes all three sites, and that is all 500 units. Um, Magnolia itself is a little over 350 units. Okay. And then we have the units in Cortland. Um, it's just over 100 and then 44 downtown. Okay, so that's, I guess, where I was confused. So all, all three housing sites are a part of the first phase. The first so, phase. So they will be going okay. at the same time. Okay. Um, and the, the Cortland Circle, you said that was seniors at 55 and above. Is that how you, I mean, when you say senior living? Yeah, so it, it would be 55 plus. Um, but aside from that, we don't plan to offer any um, independent living services or anything okay, like that, that's what but I just 55 plus age restricted. Okay. Um, Good. So all three go at the same time. Um, uh, I noticed there's no three bedrooms. Not that I disagree. The reason for no three bedrooms. 
Yeah, and looking throughout the rental housing stock throughout the city of Salina and just what's available on everything from apartments.com to Zillow to Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace, um, it seemed like there were some single family houses that were three and four bedrooms that um, can be leased and they're nice clean places with um, nice finishes. And so just in our kind of internal housing study just didn't necessarily see the need for three bedroom units. Okay. Um, and you made a comment, a question was asked about, you know, garages or carports. Do all three of these have some type of carport, garage, or, they, or do they not? And if so, what approximately is the additional rent for, you know, having a garage or a carport? So they, we do not have a garage for every or carport for every single um, unit. That is something that we could add on um, pretty easily. I would say market for that tends to be um, as high as $150 in larger metros, I would guess that we would probably try to charge between $75 and $100 um, yeah. for that. Carports are significantly less, maybe around $50 per month. So like on the West Magnolia, will there be garages built or? or and so they would be detached. Um, so right. they would maybe like skirt the outside of the the project and there and it, obviously there wouldn't be enough for each tenant but it would be kind of first come first serve correct yeah people who elect to sign up for that okay. um, would ultimately sign up and have a reserved garage and frankly a lot of people use these for storage as much as they do for their cars so <laughs> sad but true yeah, yeah. so <laughs> um, as far as and you mentioned You've talked to landowners. Do you have control of any of these sites yet, or is the, is there still negotiation to be had on on the West three Magnolia? Sites? We have a contract. You have a contract. Yeah, on, West on, Magnolia. on all the other sites, we just have what I call constructive discussions. Okay. Um, and on your timeline, again, it, when it talks about star amenities, is that talking about star bond? Yes. Um, yes, sir. But that's no, that has nothing to do with the apartments we're discussing, the 500 units. That's correct. Okay. Um, and I believe we have to use the funds by the end of 2026, right. the 25. So phasing these in, that's not going to be a problem, I take it. it it's not. And, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we kind of define phases, I guess, maybe a little bit differently. You know, we kind of phase one for us is really the entire RFP and getting all that done. Phase two is kind of the star bond thing. Inside of phase one, obviously, we're going to bring phases of apartments on, so we're not going to bring 500 units on all at once, obviously. Right. Uh, but, like I said, West Magnolia will be kind of our first mover. We'd get working on kind of that 240, 250 sort of right away. I would say downtown shortly trails that. Cortland, we probably do a little bit more planning. So I, I think that's kind of how you'll see it come on. And then we would start with sort of a second phase inside of West Magnolia A once we had absorption at the right spot. What if you don't have the right absorption? What, what's your plan? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously the economy changes uh, on a daily basis these days. Um, the, the thing is, is, you know, where rents sit today in Salina, kind of market rents, aren't necessarily commensurate with where we're hearing some of these new job income levels are going to be. So there's a strategy here, again, around this whole recruitment piece where we got to try to push rents over time to try to get it to, you know, more. If, you know, Great Plains is paying somebody 80000 bucks a year, we should be able to push rents much closer to a buck and a half as opposed to a buck 20, buck 30, whatever it might be. So it's going to be a bit of a dance over time to try to, you know, figure that out. But we're not going to do that to the detriment of the need. So, you know, as long as we're building and, and we're renting, we'll, we'll keep building. So, so on West Magnolia, there's going to be 350 units, let's say. So you're building, those, those units have 24 per building. If, is that right? Three floors times? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. So you'll build those. Will those be available for rent as you go along? You, your plan would be as you get yeah. like two of the units built, they could be rented as you build the others? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, stay Okay. One other. Okay. Go ahead. I have another one too. Yeah, as well. Uh, in reference to the proposed Star Bond project, uh, if a city was already investing a lot of money in a baseball uh, complex, mm -hmm. uh, 
would there be an alternate second sport other than soccer? In that we, we are putting money into our baseball facilities now. Uh, I don't know if we could use the second one or not, but just just curious. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, and, and I think part of you know what we would need to do is come in and do a little bit of a you know market study around you know what 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 is the need. Maybe it's a, you mentioned a swimming pool at the start of this discussion. I know it was just an example, but but maybe there is some kind of aquatics piece that we look at. So yeah, I think everything's on the table. Um, I, I do think. Soccer and kind of multi-sport fields are going to be a key component because I think having sporting Kansas City as a partner in that is, is an important thing around the Starbond piece. But everything's on the table. I'm going to follow up to that. You know, o OPE and Olathe, that's just soccer mecca there. Yes. Uh, do we really see Salina as a soccer town? Absolutely. Yeah. And again, I can tell you as an owner in Sporting Kansas City, I mean, we look at, you know, how we're going to continue to grow the game across the state. And um, we know there are lots of kids playing soccer here. And this is a town that we'd like to continue the growth of that sport. And I think we've got a huge opportunity in this entire region with the fact that we've got the World Cup being hosted in Kansas City in 2026. So, you know, I think that's why you have big brands like sporting willing to invest and in, yeah. you know trying to grow the game in places like this and and look again like i said we operate over 100 fields in kansas city and those fields are soccer football baseball little league cricket rugby i mean we've got all sorts of stuff being played gaelic football we've got all sorts of things so it, it's not as though they're just gonna sit there and say that these are soccer only absolutely not i mean they'll be open to whatever sport needs the attention okay uh, I'd like to shift direction a little bit. Uh, who's going to manage this? Yeah, was... yeah so we, um, th we've been in discussions with several ma management companies, but I think Crest Management out of Kansas City, they currently manage um, about 900 units in Manhattan, Kansas. Um, they've managed multifamily properties on behalf of um, several pension funds and institutions across the country, so um, they're a Class A operator. Um, What's their name again? CRES management, CRES C -R -E -S management, and um, their uh, two principals are Whitney Greaves and John Stevenson. Um, Whitney um, was the CEO of a privately traded REIT for a long time. Um, so, I mean, it's just an institutional quality firm that um, happens to have a lot of um, management experience in central Kansas. And so that's ultimately why um, we're kind of siding with them right now. But open i mean we're not married to them and open to other discussions as well and that's c-r-e-s yeah c-r-e-s um kind of like commercial real estate services management but it's just c-r-e-s so is that something you would go out for proposals on or they've been working with us just on budgetary items and various things throughout this process so i don't necessarily know that we would go do an rfp for it um but um, that's, again, not something we're married to and something that um, we can work with you guys on if you have some preferred management companies um, that we also look at. Okay, thank you. And, and just by nature of kind of the Qualified Opportunity Zone financing, we're going to be your owner partner for 10 years. So they, they would be our operator, but we'll be your, we'll be your equity partner. I had a question regarding that third uh, street location. Is that going to rely at all on on-street parking? Uh, for overflow or is it to uh, accommodate? No, and that's really, I mean, we talked about kind of the number of units and how we have ambitions for more in that location. That's really the limiting factor is parking. And so, no, it wouldn't, it would not all require on street parking. There would be off street parking. And safe to assume these are all gonna be composite roofs. Oh, will defer to yes. 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 What kind of windows will you be using? Uh, we'll be using uh, can you, I'm sorry, could yeah. you come up the microphone? Yeah, because sure. that way when we rebroadcast. The, re the windows will be a, uh, an Anderson probably type window of on a clad, 25-year uh, warranty. It's all pre-baked on. So it will be a real quality. They're probably four to 500 bucks each. So it's a real quality quality window. So And, and, and I guess if you, because we've talked about a little bit of everything but as far as the apartments if you could kind of walk us through the components you you talked about carpet in the bedrooms what kind of flooring you use in the kitchen and living areas um insulation 
requirements and stuff is, you know, that old thing. I don't want to be able to hear my neighbor. Sure. You know, and sure. Talk a little bit about that. I think. That's <clears throat> important. Yeah. So, uh, like I said before, there'll be 24 unit buildings, eight, eight units per level. And you said that the staircases are enclosed. Uh, we have the option to go enclosed or stay exposed. Okay. So we have that option. It's not a big deal. Um, obviously, we have to meet the uh, Salina, Salina Energy Code. So I would assume probably the roof's going to probably be an R30 bat blown in. That would be fully sprinkled. Um, the exterior walls probably be, a, I would assume, an R19. Again, this is all contingent upon your energy code. Um, it would be obviously uh, fully uh, wood construction, composite roof. Um, I told you about the windows. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, James Hardy board siding on the exterior, which is a much better product than you look at most of the stuff that I looked at yesterday around the area. Um, we're looking at stone, like I said, for the first uh, kind of a stain, uh, stone wainscot for the first uh, 10 feet. And then obviously have a little Nietzsche Hall accents here and there. I don't know if you're familiar with Nietzsche Hall. It's an architectural wood product. It's uh, super, super cool. We do a lot of that in Kansas City. Um, we'll have uh, composite decks. Um, trying to think what else. Um, and then obviously in the units, like I said, there'll be plywood cabinets, quartz or granite countertops, depending on what's available at the time. As you guys know, construction materials right now, it's just kind of hit or miss, right? Depending on what product you pick out. And obviously time's money. So, But it, it'll either be granite or quartz. Uh, plywood cabinets, um, LVT, are you familiar with what LVT is? It's kind of a linoleum vinyl tile. It looks like a wood floor. And then obviously uh, we'll have, um, we will pour an inch of gypcrete on top of the floors above to give you that sound. We got to hit an IIC meeting, uh, standard uh, for multifamily. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that's... What, what was that on the, you had on the floors for... So, so what it's called is called gypcrete. So what you do is uh, with wood frame construction in apartments, once you uh, set your floor down, your plywood, and once you're whatever point you are in the stage of construction, you pour a one inch of gypcrete topping over the top of that. Uh, that helps with sound, helps with fire. But again, these are fully, fully sprinkled buildings. And I think that's by code. They have to, everything yep. will have to be fully sprinkled. Well, co code won't. Yeah, it could, or you could go an extra layer of drywall down below. So, um, what are we? What are you using for sound insulation between the apartments? Do you have? Yeah. So what that'll be? That'll be a double stud wall. Okay. And then what we do is on that stud wall, it's called a resilient channel. I don't know if you're familiar with what. It's really we call it hat channel. So. Yeah, you're going to need to do construction for dummies. <laughs> just for anybody else sitting in the audience, construction for dummies is Yeah, best. so just just imagine this. you got a two-by-six wall, which it'll be a two-by double stud wall. And they have, it's called a, well, it's called a uh, resilient channel. It goes on the outside. It gives you a dip. So with sound, you want to create gaps. You want to trap the sound in the wall, right? And so we got to hit an STC of 55. And a part of that STC 55, because they do all these tests, is doing the double studs, double layer insulation, two layers of rock on it, or one layer of rock on one side, two layers on the other side, that's in this, uh, attached to this hat channel, or this resilient channel. So it traps the sound. <coughs> that might be too much information, but anyway. At least, at least you've addressed the sound, and that's, a, that's the important thing. It's like, uh, yeah, I mean, it, here's that. the deal with multifamily. If, if, you're, if your apartment's leak sound, it's gonna be hard to uh, it's gonna be hard to lease them, and uh, that's a big uh, big uh, deal with us. We want to make sure we got a good solid product that uh, we meet the STC and the IIC ratings, along with the energy codes. So, um, I have a follow up to okay. that. Uh, uh oh, we yeah we all know about the labor shortages. Who's gonna build all this? Who's gonna what? Who's gonna build it all? Uh, Luke Drayley Construction is gonna build it all. <laughs> The what? Well, that's part of labor shortages. Oh, you mean labor shortages? So we have a, uh, so obviously I'm the president of Luke Drayley Construction, right? As I said earlier, we have uh, access to uh, 10,000 subcontractors without 
I'm going to say from St. Louis to Colorado, right? And um, so with this database, what we'll do as we're getting the plants finished, and we'll send them out to subcontractor bidding, right? And then we'll, again, this is maybe too much information, but to answer your question, we don't feel labor is gonna be a problem in Salina, Kansas, because we've done business out here. In fact, I've done business all the way west to Colorado. So we have that resource. Um, and really, if you think about it, you're looking at drywallers, framers, and that's, that's your biggest thing. And we've got plenty of resources for that. So when it, when it comes to plumbing, electrical, uh, heating and air, do you have your own subcontractors or will that be bid out and where local contractors would have the so, option to bid? Yeah, so that's exactly right. We will, so once the plans are done, it will go out to all Salina subcontractors, Topeka subcontractors, Wichita subcontractors, and as far west as uh, Colorado, right? So we encourage uh, local subcontractor participation. I mean, that's our whole goal. So we build all over the country. We're in Minneapolis. We're in Colorado. We're, we're all over the, the Midwest. And what we try to do, and we do pretty effectively, and that's how we have all that, that subcontractor base, is use local uh, labor participation. Could you give me the name of your construction company yeah, again? Because you talk faster than I write, and I'm not <laughs> sure I got it all down. It's called uh, Luke. Draley Construction spill Company. That, spill that last. D as in dog, R-A-I-L-Y. Okay, construction. So yeah, if you, if you get a chance, you might take a look at our website. That'll give you a good idea what we do uh, besides multifamily, Whole Foods, grocery stores, uh, athletic complexes. And we've been doing this for 20, we just celebrated our 20, I'm a first generation owner too, so anyway. About gave away your age, telling you how long you've been doing it. So anyway, <laughs> um, this may be a little unusual, but I'm going to look to city staff to see if you have any questions um, or that may be helpful to us since you've already kind of been through this as a group. No, I pre appreciate the opportunity. Um, back to the star bonds a little bit. Um, total size of that, dollar wise, to be determined. I mean, again, it. it Depends on kind of what our catchment area is, obviously, uh, for the retail sales tax. Um, I would guess that it'd be no smaller than 10. I would guess that it probably wouldn't be any larger than 30. Uh, and, you know, there'd be some work for us to go do to be able to sell bonds at the $30 million level. So, yeah, but, but I mean, I, the, the way that we kind of look at it is, is build a master plan. Um, once we do that master plan, obviously, there will be an underlying revenue study associated with it. Uh, you know, there's some things going on in the legislature around retail sales tax. You know, we'd like to obviously include Menards in the uh, in the Star Bond district, and the question will be, what would be available through Menards? Would it just be increment, or is there the opportunity potentially for us to look at some of the base sales tax that exists today? So there's there's just a number of different factors for us to look at, but. There's probably, um, you know, speculatively $15 million worth of amenities that we'd be building. So we're going to probably want that star bond to at least be a $15 million star bond. And, and again, we'd, we'd probably, you know, pump it up for a little bit more room as, as kind of the, the plan grows. And likely we would do sort of a series of issuances of bonds themselves. So who owns and operates and manages the amenities? Well, the, by, by nature of the law, uh, the developer has to own the amenities. Um, the city can't, uh, the state can't, um, and we've worked in all different sorts of situations. So, in, you know, in, in Wyandotte County, we have a complex that, that the county owns, and we operate at risk. Uh, you know, in a deal we're working on at Lee Summit right now, the park department owns the amenity and operates it. Um, on a deal that we're, you know, working on uh, down in Texas, it's it's going to be a complete, you know, third-party private operator that's operating the baseball park. So we're open to looking at it in a number of different ways. Okay. And the mayor touched on property ownership, but you, you indicated the need for more uh, visioning and, and conversations. How does that fit into the timeline? Well, I mean, I, I think it's one of those things it's, it's it, it, you know, as soon as we were, you know, to prevail, if we were lucky enough to prevail, I think we'd, we'd be on those, you know, right away. 
Um, you know, the contingent nature of our contract on West Magnolia A is that we'd be closing on that, you know, almost immediately and obviously start planning on that. And then I think kind of the next phase of that is, is really getting with uh, Don Booz and the Walker family and talking about the vision for kind of what the downtown site looks like. Uh, because if we were to expand the site, there's going to have to be some substantive conversations potentially with the school district that, you know, I'm sure those are never the simplest you know, negotiations or discussions. But, but if we think it's the right kind of master plan, we think it's something that could be fruitful for them as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's something that we'll jump into, you know, right away okay. uh, obviously if you di did not get control of the Cortland um, circle would let's just be simplistic if if you didn't get control of one of those other two sites would your plans be to move one of those to the other whether it would be move the the 44 apartments from downtown to the Cortland or vice versa or does do those completely can contingent upon getting control of those grounds to mat to meet the full number of units to so built. um Cortland circle is probably the one that's different from everything because it's not in a qualified opportunity zone but it's really good real estate and so we we just think that that piece over time provides us a lot of opportunity to create you know a good yielding product so so that that site is and, and again I, I i feel like the discussions that we've had with with mr applequist on that site um, we'll be able to get a deal done there. I'm, I'm not really concerned about that. Uh, I also feel the conversations that I've had with Mr. Boos around um, the site downtown, I feel like we can get control of that. I don't think it's really about that first site. I think it's about, is it that site more? So uh, would we just move product around? Uh, probably not, because I, I think, again, like specifically the downtown site, we think fulfills a need at the hospital around nursing, like I said. The Cortland site, we like the senior product there. And I do think, to go back to one of your questions way early on, I do think downstream, once we have absorption, I think there could be a two and three bedroom type product that goes on that site that I think fits that expat community that's important to Mr. Applequist and Mr. Hall. So I, I think that's kind of how we're looking at it. And I think we feel like we've got good control over the sites just by the nature of, I think we want to be responsive to what those constituents want at those sites. Okay. Yeah, I just had to ask. No, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> so, have you done the homework on the infrastructure or these sites all, you know, shovel ready as far as utilities and um, can the utilities handle what you want? No, we, we haven't done sort of a full, you know, survey on, on all that. Um, the Cortland site, I believe, is, is shovel ready. The, the West Magnolia site, Bob, you can speak to it. I mean, I, I think there's there's some site conditions that we need to work on there. Um, but yeah, no, we, we haven't gotten into full-blown civil on, on any of the sites yet at this point. I guess that'd be a good question for city staff, knowing those properties, because those, those properties have kind of been in discussions before where we at as far as those properties being the, up and run, you know, right. ready for construction. Um, there's infrastructure in place in the Liberty Edition, which would be Cortland Circle. There's infrastructure, base infrastructure in place on the east side of the creek at West Magnolia. Um, the west side is undeveloped. We, as part of the Menards project, we loop water, sewer, and street. The west side installed. of Cortland or the west? I'm sorry, the west side of the Magnolia site on the other side of the tree line. And the flood plain. Which that, the flood that's plain. the flood plain. Flood plain flood, flood, so we don't yep. really care. Well, if I mean, you have restrooms or you have some facilities outside the flood As far plain. as the apartments go, right. that's right. not a, okay. And then uh, the downtown site, there is infrastructure there. Depends on you know, whether there needs to be any upgrades or any maintenance addressed. Because that's Hundred year olds, right. possibly hundred year old. Uh, yeah. yeah, which um, that, we that, talk that, about infill, yeah. which is always good. But and you always talk that, about you that have was to. my concern. The the hundred hundred and twenty. Yeah, year we know from the downtown Starbine project, we the utilities had to be moved out of the way. There are existing alleys uh, with utilities running through them. Those kind of things. But, but those are not uncommon for for no. infra, when when you're doing infill, you always have those same concerns whether it's moving utilities or 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 needing right. to upgrade utilities they're not without expense but it's yeah. not un, unforeseen and or, it's not atypical. how would those expenses be handled as far as on the third street does that become a cost uh, yeah, to the, the developer? our our anticipation by the rfp is it should stand alone we um so we would look to the project to include that in their their finances 
The housing downtown uh, would not qualify for any of the Starbond housing. It could. It, it, well, it's, and, it's out, outside of the district right now, is it? Um, the, the site at Third Street, uh, I think, is within the district, and yeah. there is okay. some uh, provision for apartment uh, development as part of that Starbond district. The other thing that that reminds me of is the county funds are only available in low to moderate income census tracts, and I don't know that any of these sites are LMI qualified. Um, as far as the third street, yeah, I, I be, I'm not sure if that's what the Rob was just um, was discussing, but we there's that we're collecting money for potential apartments right. in that downtown area that's that's been building and not been used yet, correct? And that would be correct. available for this site. And that that would be a pay-as-you-go allocation right. um, as increment is generated. It wouldn't be upfront funds, but There's, there are some funds, but then it grows, so those right. funds would be available over time. Okay. Correct. Um, one thing that I thought might be useful is we did ask each of the respondents to uh, provide kind of a, a numeric breakdown, fill out a spreadsheet, which they provided. So I think Ms. Driscoll is prepared to distribute those and then give them an opportunity to walk you through those. I actually had a question regarding, and pardon me if I get too far into the intricacies of construction, but I can't help but notice some of the renderings here, like the uh, Lee Summit and PV locations. Um, there's some nice amenities as far as the the window banks, and they're f almost floor to ceiling. You've got step ceilings. You have uh, glass enclosed showers, et cetera. Uh -huh. Are any of those finishings going to end up in these projects? Yes. And what are our ceiling heights? Thank you. Uh, ceiling heights will be nine foot. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the, the picture you saw earlier is really pretty close to what you're going to see here in Salina. So they'll be top quality. So. Thank you. You bet. How, how many, at the Magnolia property, how many total structures would there be to? Uh, what do we got on there, Rob? 396 units. Um, uh, which one? So, so said 350 is what I had. Yeah, it'd be about 15 buildings. 15. Yeah. Then obviously, you know, we would be turning over buildings every so many months, right? You one at a time. Yeah, probably. It's all about good. Yep, for sure. Thanks. And earlier you mentioned about, you know, pushing those rents up as time goes on. Is there a rough timeline you guys have in mind? No, I mean, just get what the market will allow, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, so we're, we're, we would plan on introducing them kind of as we're proposing. And, and again, over time, it's going to work with it. Sounds good. Thank you. So what Ms. Driscoll distributed is a, is a tally that we developed a, as staff to try to make a side-by-side -side comparison of, of different proposals. So really just inventorying the unit mix, the square footages of those units, the rent rates per month, and converting that to a rent per square foot, um, tallying up the total units as well as total square footage, average rent rate, average square footage, project cost. Um, and so we that's something that we pulled out of the uh, initially submitted proposal information, but then asked the, each of the proposers to review, verify, fill in any blanks so that you have that as kind of a summary. Uh, I want to give you the opportunity, if, if you'd like, to add any context to that as the response. Yeah, so this should mirror um, what is on the rental slide. Um, in the slide deck that was distributed earlier. The only difference I see is on the, the Yeah, I, I just the, noticed that. Um, three bedroom, yeah. And so which, those, those are going to be t the two bedroom villa as well. Okay. Um, just given what I discussed earlier, as far as the. So two it's not three a three bedroom. bedroom. Correct. So yeah, it should okay. be two bedroom. Okay. 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 I want to be sure to give Mr. Webster an opportunity. Yeah, um, uh, Rob. Uh, irrespective of the of the star bonds, but uh, but getting just back to the residential loan, what do you, what do you see as as a major challenge or or, or the thing that, to be most concerned about uh, sort of executing this? I mean, just you know, not that it's not overcomable. It's very overcomable, but just the debt, construction debt is just tough right now um, with where rates are. Um, but that's you know, it's just the world we live in, so we'll we'll make it work. Um, I, I think we feel very confident about 
the flow of bodies coming to Salina through, you know, these jobs. And these are high quality jobs. So I, I think we feel good about sort of all the, you know, demographics. And, and so it's, it's really just getting the construction debt figured out. Okay, thank you. And just to follow up on that, one thing in our sources and unit, our sources and uses, um, and what I mentioned on kind of backing into what is the stabilized loan going to look like, our construction debt request is only about 50% loan to cost. So it's not like we're looking at this and saying, hey, we need to go get um, an 80% loan to cost loan to make this work. And we've tried to be very prudent and conservative to ensure that um, we're going to be able to procure the financing needed. Yeah, because it looked like your debt was about 48 million yeah. is what yeah. you anticipated. Yeah. But, I mean, that's another good piece of the kind of the qualified opportunity zone is we want to get some money to work, you know, in the deal. So it'll be, it'll have over equitized. So er, early on in your comments, you, and I'd have to go back in my notes, but essentially you said something to the effect of you have the funds on hand to finance this. Uh, who Who are you referring to, or with this being kind of a unique team you put together for this project. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so we have equity. We have an equity fund inside of 635 Holdings. Uh, so we have the equity available for the project. Yeah, we do not have the debt raised. You know, like I said, that, that'll be a process, but the equity we have. And you yeah. said you do your debt financing at the end, so your, your, what I call your end financing, you, don't, you would not do until the end of the construction. You just use your own funds up to that point, kind of? Uh, probably a mix of both. No, we would have a construction loan and, and process, and yeah, we'd be using our equity as well. How do you perceive the distribution of the available $27 million? Um, Alex, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. I, I, I mean, I think that's that's a discussion to be had, frankly. Yeah, I think that's a discussion with you guys and open to ideas. I know we had talked about it in some of the previous meetings, um, but the sooner the better, uh, just <laughs> frankly. Um, <laughs> the, the more point, equity yeah. in the deal, um, <laughs> the less interest carry we've got to have in our budget. Um, so the sooner we can put that money to work, I think the better for everybody. Um, the return on the city's dollar, or maybe we get it in lieu of a construction loan for a period of time and pay interest to the city. I mean, there are a myriad of solutions we could come to, um, but I really think the quicker we can get that money to work, the better. In the interest of full disclosure, we, from the staff's perspective, our response was wanting to work with them, but that's, uh, part that's of kind our, of the, the negotiation, of the development agreement, development and agreement, yeah. uh, how you hold uh, things accountable to project completion. Yep. So. And would the, the management company that secured do the marketing? Yes, yes, they would do the, the leasing, marketing, uh, repairs and maintenance, um, everything a professional management company is expected to do. I want to give the other staff that were on the uh, the evaluation committee the opportunity to raise any questions or points. Please. So I'll throw it open to Lauren, Jacob, and Sean, and Debbie. Yes, my question is zero. Lauren, you're going to need to go to a microphone. I don't know if these are on over here. Um, should be. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Come to the podium real quick. I guess my question is the 55 and plus villas, is there any chance those don't have to be? Because one of the things we've heard from employers is having family housing, which is three plus bedroom typically. So is 55 a must to make the deal work? No, I, 55 plus is not a must. Um, that is simply, we found it just from a marketing perspective in certain scenarios. Um, someone who's in their mid 60s may not want to be next door neighbors with someone who's 25, just different hobbies. Um, and so um, just that bifurcation sometimes is better for both parties. And in the housing study, I think it did indicate a need for 80 units in the senior. So that, that was part of the part of what influenced us there. But again, we're open to what, whatever makes sense for the for the city. I guess I have one uh, quick question. Um, in, in your summary, you, you indicated there's uh, anticipated $15 million in star bond proceeds, and I, I presume that's for the amenities. Uh, is, is that correct? So that's totally segregated from the funding that is needed for the apartments and would only be directed towards the amenities? Star bonds is completely distinct from, from the RFP. And, and I'm just, I, I just threw 15 out there. I mean, if you just think about if we built four soccer fields and four baseball fields, that's probably a, you know, 10 to 12 to 
million dollar project. If we did some other things like a pool or whatever, that's a couple billion bucks. So uh, that's complete conjecture and speculation until we sort of like dug into it. But but again, I, I don't necessarily just see something. There's not a huge sales tax generator that I can say, oh, we're going to do a hundred million dollar Starbond project. That it's just. I don't see us being able to generate that level of retail sales tax. So it's, I think it's more tenable that we're going to be in sort of that 10 to 30-ish range. And to get to 30, we're going to have to do a lot of work. Yeah. And one of the things that I guess wasn't discussed, and probably ought to ask this in case one of the other developers has this in theirs, is there a, a, are there pools located at any of these or clubhouses or a little bit of that? I'd hate to not ask that, and then somebody brings it up later, and we have yeah, absolutely. Um, as you mentioned earlier, in some of the pictures from the other properties, and if you went to Luke Draley's website, um, I think that would give some additional context to um, the amenity packages. But um, the amenity package, um, when you have 500 units, it'll have a pool, pickleball courts. Um, there'll be a fitness center um, within the community, um, so it'll be consistent with Class A properties across the Midwest. That would be at the Magnolia. Not yeah, that, the, the amenities would all be at the Magnolia right. um, site. So the 44 unit downtown may have a small gym, but that, that property will not have a That's pool. Um, Same way with the... Yeah, Cortland yeah. likely would not have a pool either. It's just, um, it just starts to become cost prohibitive with only a little over 100 You don't units. want a lot of 55 year olds in swimming suits is what you're saying. So, yeah. anyway, so. <laughs> Okay, I, thank you for that, because I'm, I'm glad we asked that, or we'd have been coming back to that afterwards. Any other questions on amenities, the actual staff? Do I don't we? think we have anything else at the moment. Um, we weren't exactly sure how long the interviews would go, yeah. and we did not book any time in between, so. This, uh, this would give us. We're off to a good start, maybe. <laughs> the time minutes works. for a real slow transition, so I can run out and run back in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if you if you want to recess till ten. Uh, yeah, well, I think we'll do that. That'll give us a chance, and want to thank everyone for being here. It's been very helpful. So we'll. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commission. We appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. We'd love to do this with you. I think it'd be a home run project. So okay. appreciate the time. Thank you very thank much, you. Rob. Okay, it's uh, 10 o'clock and we're ready for our second presentation. I'll look at city staff, say if you want to have some opening comments, yeah, Mike. And then keep we'll it short and sweet. Our second uh, presentation is from Salina Destination Development. Rick Warner is the point of contact that we've uh, been uh, discussing with us previously. I'll turn it over to him. I know he's got others with his team here that he'll probably want to introduce, but I'll let you dive in. Okay, so good morning. Thank good morning. you for inviting us. Um, my partner in this project is Dave Murphan, who's sitting here on the front row. For those of you that know Dave, you know he's a very successful Kansas businessman. For those of you that don't know Dave, Dave and I are the most famous Kansans nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> so um, Dave owns dozens of companies in rural Kansas, across the country, but in rural Kansas. Feel free to Google Dave, and you'll see he's former member of the Board of Regents, um, lots of business awards, lots of, lots of uh, business activities. If you Google me, you'll find out that I'm a member of the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> so um, Dave and I have been partners over 10 years. We are Kansans. I think we're the only group you're going to see where the ownership's going to be Kansans. Um, we invest in Kansas, we live in Kansas, our sons are involved in our businesses, they're Kansans. Um, it's important because there are a lot of decisions that down the road, if we need to make changes or things happen, that people care about Kansas and Salina, Kansas. Dave and I own a shopping center together in, in Wichita. Uh, Dave and I, I own a shopping center in Garden City. We are about to build apartments similar to this in Derby, Kansas. Um, and so um, there's our team on the, on the right. Um, it's going to be Kansas built. Our contractor's with us today. It's Jayco out of Wichita. Kansas designed, GMLV 
uh, Architects out of Wichita, and then Kansas Managed Wigan Omega out of Wichita. Also today, we've got our bank. It's UMB Bank of Salina um, is interested in, in uh, making the loan. Um, we didn't hire any lobbyists, you know, to, to help us with this. Dave's got uh, Jerry Moran and Roger Marshall's cell phones in his phone. <laughs> I've got Dave Tolan and Bob North in mine. We've got direct access. Together, Dave and I have done a couple billion dollars worth of development in Kansas. I've got 600 million pending in Kansas right now. And so we've got pretty good access to anybody you know, we need to see. We are ready to go. Other people will tell you they're ready to go. We're ready to go. We've submitted plans to city staff on, a, on what we're going to build. So we've got site control. We've got plans. Now, depending, the only thing we've got to do, though, is we have to adapt the plans to the site because uh, originally we thought they were going to, the city wanted 500 apartments. And originally, we had the two sites, what we call the Magnolia site and the Ambassador site. Then, during the interviews, we got the impression that we could come back with a slightly different plan than 500 apartments. So as we go through our presentation, you'll see we've, we've modified um, our plan. But we've got a plan that we could build 250 apartments on the, on the uh, Magnolia site. Um, and so if we'll go to the next slide. So those are the two sites, the Ambassador site and the Magnolia site. We have both of those sites under control. But to be honest with you, we would not recommend the Ambassador site. The reason why we wouldn't recommend the Ambassador site is, and I haven't seen all the articles, but the owner of the Ambassador site says, hey, in the paper, it said that the city's willing to pay $2 million for my site, and so I want $2 million for my site. Then it's another million, in here I've got the numbers, the exact numbers, but it's another million seven to tear down the site and prep the site. So you're at three million seven for that site. We don't think that's a good value. I mean, just that's just our opinion. We don't think that's a good value. So the site we would recommend is the Magnolia site. It's 40 acres. Given that what we've heard is that maybe we could do some duplexes and some single family, we, if we can't get everything we want to do on that 40 acres, Todd Welsh is here. We've identified some land, some land adjacent to this site that Todd has said, hey, you can, we can buy some additional land if we need additional land. Part of this depends on the density that city staff will let us do. But we've got plenty of land to start the first 250. And so if we're selected, I'm not saying you're going to say today, but if we're selected today, we would start, without the development agreement, we'd start to spend money today. And we would start the engineering. And we, we've already spent $50,000 on this, as crazy as that's going to sound. And I'll t talk to you a little bit about what we spent money on. And so we would start today. We would hope to be, again in the presentation, under construction this summer. Um, next slide, please. So the, the uh, alternatives, this is our alternative where we would do mixed on the Magnolia, where we would actually come in and do between 250 and 350 apartments and do the rest duplexes on the site. If we're successful with Todd to buy some additional land, uh, we would buy some additional land and do single family, uh, small lot single family. And what I've learned from Todd is that there are certain price points that if you can achieve those price points, the single family's got a high desirability in, in Salina. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows just uh, doing the 500 apartments. Again, we wouldn't recommend this for a couple reasons. But one is we could fit it all on the ambassador site. But again, at a $2 million acquisition price and a million seven demolition, I think that's kind of crazy. But I'll defer to the city. If, if you guys said, no, we got to have that site, you know, we, we can 
try to make that work. Or if you said, hey, no, we've got to do all 500 apartments, we could obviously make it fit on the Magnolia site. Um, so we, part of the money we spent is, this is $10,000. This was an apartment study, housing study for Salina. It recommends 250 apartments. It gives me absorption rates, rents, all, it recommends all kinds of things. Um, and so after we had our Zoom call with the city staff, and it, it became clear then that, hey, you don't have to do 500 apartments as long as you do 500 units, that's when we, that's when we said, hey, uh, went back to our guys and said, how soon could we start on everything? And so, guys, we could start on all 500 units this year, as opposed to phasing, because we'd be doing 250 apartments and we'd be doing 140 duplexes and 50 single families, so we could start on everything this year. Next slide, please. So again, that just shows that on, on that site that all 500 units would fit. Next point, next slide, please. This is, this shows the amenities, would have a clubhouse, would have pickleball court, would have basketball court, playground, uh, barbecue area, 65 garages, um, and then the unit mix shows if we did 500 apartments, uh, but under the mixed housing option to the right under unit mix, uh, we would do, I think it's just, I'm blind, guys, I apologize. <laughs> so we do 204 one bedroom, 162 two bedroom, and then uh, the rest would be duplexes and single family. Next slide, please. These are some pictures of what uh, the duplexes could look like. We've, we've got pricing on the construction cost of these duplexes and, uh, and the rents below. Next slide, please. So this is our budget. If we did the 364 apartments with 134 duplexes without any single family, it's a $68 million investment. Um, we've got UMB Bank here. Once you give us a site and say, this is what, this is the site we want you to develop on. Once you say, hey, we're okay doing single family or we're okay doing X number of duplexes, we, we can get a loan commitment very, very quickly. UMB loves Dave. Dave's a very, very successful businessman. UMB calls on Dave and asks him to please borrow $20 million. UMB asked me to open a checking account. Okay, I mean, that's kind of the difference in scope. He's, he's a very, very successful businessman. And so that's why we brought UMB here. We didn't think anybody else would bring their bank here. And in the question and answer period, We'll let you ans ask any questions of UMB, our architects, our engineers, whoever you want to ask questions to. Next slide, please. So if we do 366 apartments at Magnolia, subject to we've got to annex the site, but se assuming everybody says go today, we could start construction this July. And we could, and again, we've submitted a full set of plans. We have to adapt the plans to the site, but uh, we've submitted a full set of plans. Um, we would, we could deliver the first 250 by December 15th of 2024 and deliver the next 116 April 15th of 2025. Um, the duplexes would all be uh, done by June 15th of 2025. Single family, again, I've got to find from the city staff how many units you want, can I put them adjacent to the Magnolia site, but we would meet the same kind of timetable uh, for small lot single family. Next, and we have completed all the structural, mechanical, plumbing, all the electrical design already. So as, as opposed to other people that say, oh, we want to build something like this, we know what we want to build. Next slide, please. Here's the budget for the 500 units. Again, this was our original budget. And it goes to show you that the land acquisition, I'm sorry, it's 2,000,007. And then uh, demolition's 1,000,007. 
So again, we think the ambassador site has priced itself out of the market to make any sense at all for us. Next slide, please. So the grant request would request the $25 million ARPA grant, what I'm referring to as the ARPA grant, the $2 million from the city and county. The debt and the equity, if you said you got to go on the uh, very expensive site where we got to tear down the hotel, it changes the debt and the equity we've got to have. And so we need just a little more guidance from you guys on exactly what you want, and we can come back with the, the debt and the equity. Dave and I don't need to go raise any money for the equity. We, we talked about doing an opportunity zone. I'm probably the only guy you're going to talk to today that actually has done opportunity zone financing, has an opportunity zone fund, has funded opportunity zone projects. What they don't tell you is you got to go raise that money from third party people. You got to, so we don't need to do that. We can, we've got all the equity we're going to need personally to, uh, to build the apartments. We've got UMB Bank here to, to confirm we can borrow the money on the debt side, subject to you guys telling me the site and, and things like that. Um, next page. The first 250 at Magnolia. Um, this was if we we're just doing the 500. We're, not, we're no longer recommending the 500 based on the study. Uh, but just in case you guys said you've got to do the 500, we want to be true to our original submission because our original submission came in before we did the Zoom call with staff. Next slide, please. So, guys, time is our enemy. We have got to get going as fast as we can. The, we have, we've got deadlines. We've got deadlines to spend the money. It would be a crime for us to send back any of the money. <laughs> Secondly, you've got absorption rates. On apartments, I was hoping the absorption rates were higher. According to the study, the absorption rates, the new absorption rates, are 15 units a month. Now, there's pent-up demand for, let's say, 80 units, I believe. And so over time, the sooner you get the units started, the sooner those units get built, the faster they'll be absorbed into the marketplace and they won't disrupt the market. Because the other thing I don't want to do is get every local guy in town who lives here and votes for you guys mad at you because the absorption's taking so long and, and we're, we're having an impact on their business. So I want to get these in as fast as I can, get them absorbed into the market as fast as I can. And by having a mix, apartments, duplexes, single family, I actually get to use three different absorption rates. There's a different absorption rate for duplexes. There's a dish, different absorption rate uh, for single family. So our goal would be to tap all three markets to absorb these faster so we can, we can uh, meet your goals. And then I, I covered unit mix, local politics. That was my reference to, I don't want everybody, every person in town that owns apartments or you know owns duplexes mad at me because it's taken four years for us to, to rent these out. I, I want to be a positive to the community, not a negative to the community. Uh, under land acquisition, I'd like to stress that uh, we've got the, the uh, Magnolia site under option. As soon as you guys tell, tell us to go, I'm going to turn the engineers loose to adapt our plans to that site. And then we would close on the Magnolia site the day after you guys approve the development agreement. Uh, next slide, please. These are similar projects uh, that we built. Um, again, we are building a very similar project in Derby. I did, I've done more Starbond projects than anybody in the state of Kansas. I did four Starbond projects in Kansas City, Kansas, Starbond project in which, several Starbond projects in Wichita, Starbond project in Derby, Starbond project in Goddard. I'm under construction for a fine art museum at K -St in downtown Manhattan, K-State, but downtown Manhattan. Um, working on a uh, second Starbond project in Garden City. Talking to Hayes about doing a Starbond project. So I've done more Starbond projects than anybody else. Dave has been my partner on the vast majority of those. Starbond projects take a lot of time. 
Just the hearings are 90 days. You gotta have studies done before you do the hearings. We haven't proposed uh, any star bond, and you can't use star bonds to go vertical for apartments. You can only use star bonds uh, to build vertical on two things, multi-sport athletic facilities and museums. That's all you can use star bonds for, to go vertical. And so we didn't need star bonds. Now, as another thing we spent money on, this is another $30,000 and this is a retail study. I'm sorry, it's not nearly as pretty as the housing study. But the retail study, we went through and said, what retailers are missing in Salina? And, and through this retail study, I want to tell you I'm really good, but it's really lucky. <laughs> I've already got two restaurants out of Wichita that says they'll come to Salina if we do the project. It's called the AIM Group. We're doing a steak restaurant with them in, in Derby right now. And as I was talking to them about the retail study and the need for restaurants and things like that, the AIM Group says, hey, you get this project done, you get this project going, we'd be interested in, in coming with you and, and going to Salina. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the single family options. Now, these are smaller than normal lots. These are small lot single family homes. And so, but it gives you a sense of, of uh, what they could look like. And again, depending on staff and zoning, if you wanted to do townhomes, we could, we could do townhomes as well. But the key, according to Todd, I'm throwing Todd under the bus here. He's here somewhere, there he is in the corner, is price point. You gotta deliver the right price point. Doesn't make sense to build a $500,000 house for a, for a new family. You know, you gotta deliver the price point. The other thing on our duplexes, we want to try to do rent to own. And there are some advantages to rent to own. One of them is, so I'm doing a lot of housing across Kansas right now. Kansas has a separate program called a first time home buyer program. And if we did a lease to own um, duplex, Kansas has grants outside of Johnson, Wyandotte, Douglas, $25,000 per ho uh, home buyer. And so, if our duplex cost, you know, $175,000 to build, and if we could allocate this money and, and the incentive money, now we can buy the price of that duplex down for home ownership to a much more affordable uh, cost. And so um, I think that's the last slide, but go to one more. Is that it? I think that's it. So to go back, we're the only, I think we're the only Kansans based on the agenda that you're gonna see. We're keepers, not flippers. Dave's grandfa grandfather built apartments in the 40s in Wichita. Dave still owns those apartments. We're not merchant guys that are gonna come in, build, flip. If something goes wrong, we're, we live in Kansas, we invest in Kansas. If you count our debt, we've got a couple hundred million in debt out, you know, on you know, Garden City and Wichita and Derby and and so we're not going anywhere. We're we're Kansans. Um, and so we think it's in your best interest to have people with whose interests are aligned for Kansas to do well, for Salina to do well. If if there's a problem, it was two hours and fifteen minutes. One of the reasons why I love Salina, after the meeting tonight, even if we have a meeting this afternoon or, or eight o'clock tonight, I can be home and sleep in my own bed. You know, some of these other projects, I've got project in Spokane, Washington. Two days to get up, two days to get back. It's bad. But Salina, it's a short drive. You get to think all the way up and all the way back. And so I love doing projects in Kansas and that's why Dave and I invest a lot in Kansas. So with that, we'll take any questions you have. Uh, quite a few, swing back my way. I'll, I'll let Bill go first. Okay. Uh, I was surprised to hear you, you bring up the term duplex. That's kind of a, a term from 
days gone by, everyone calls them townhomes today. Why do you call them duplexes? So before I moved in Kansas City, um, there's a, a developer by the name of Greg Preeb. I don't know if you've ever heard of Greg Preeb, but he built, he does market them as townhomes, but he built all these duplexes and they have sold like hotcakes. And so I'm old. So they're duplexes to me. Now you may call them townhomes, you may call them something else, but you know, they're, they're two homes attached and you save a lot of money on lot costs and infrastructure and, and all that. So um, you could call them townhomes or we could rebrand them townhomes, but uh, I'm old. When I was growing up, they were called duplexes. And when I as same, same as, yeah, as duplexes. <laughs> So they would be uh, 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 rental units or sold for investment properties? So our, no, they would be rental units or sold as owner-occupied properties. Okay. Okay. And it's, now this is the social scientist in me. It's always better to get people to own their homes than to rent their homes. That was the way I was raised. Right. So if I can get somebody into a duplex that costs $175,000 and I can buy their cost down to a lot lower, they become invested not only in the house, but they become invested more invested in the community. So I'm all about home ownership. Now, we're going to be committed to build these units. And if nobody wants to buy them, we're going to have X number of townhomes that we're going to rent. But... Our plan isn't to sell them to a third-party investor. Our plan is to either own them and rent them or create a first-time home buyer market where people can, this would be their starter home. Okay, and are you aware that we currently have a development getting underway for is it 150 townhome duplexes? So, yeah, Todd's made me aware. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure you... And, and wait a minute, he's a full-service broker. I mean, he'll call me and say, hey, now here's what you have to think about before you come to Salina. And, uh, and so um, sometimes I like what he says, sometimes I don't like what he says. Yeah. But, you know, he's given, yeah, he's made us aware of that. I, I guess this kind of threw me. I, I was expecting 100% apartments. And uh, the I didn't realize the duplex was on the table, but... Uh, that was a little surprise to me. Who would uh, who would uh, be building this? Josh. So Jayco is headquartered in Wichita, and if you have any construction, I know how to finance and put the projects together. I don't know what size nail you use or what size pipe, but that's why I got Josh here to answer any construction questions. Okay. Uh, and the management. So manage. there's a management company headed up by a guy by the name of Bob Hansen out of Wichita. If you know Wichita at all, there's a real estate company called um, J.P. Wygand. Mm -hmm. Bob used to be at J.P. Wygand. He formed his own management company. It's called Wygand Omega. And he manages thousands of apartments and townhomes across Kansas. And they'd be our manager. And the ambassador site, have you tried to negotiate with the property owner? So we offered a lot less. He said, no, you don't understand. It's been in the paper. The city's given me $2 million for this site. That's my rock bottom number. And I said, I'm not aware of that. And I said, I think this thing max is worth $800,000. He said, no, you didn't see the article in the paper. The city's got $2 million, a million from the city, a million from the county for my site. And I'm like, what do you say to that? Say thank you very much. The now, I still put it under option just in case you said it's got to be on the site. Yeah, the value is what someone's willing to pay for something. That's I agree with you 100%. And I do believe if we start on this site and we're six months down the road and reality sets in, we might be able to go back and, and you know, renegotiate and put some units there. But today... It's been in the paper. The city's got a million dollars. The county's got a million dollars. So it's off the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very much on the table. So I should write the check. <laughs> okay. 
I've never met, and his name's Joshua. Great guy, but I've never met anybody kind of like that. No, you didn't read the paper. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of interest is to develop that property. And, you know, I'm sorry to hear, you know, that it's, from your assessment, it's not doable. Well, I'm not saying it's not doable. I'm saying it's not feasible. a crazy price to pay. Okay. <laughs> Look, without ha hiring an appraiser, I think the max price for that should be about $800,000, max price. And when you have this kind of distance, unless the city said you've got to do <coughs> that site, as a private developer would never spend $2.7 million buying something that's worth 800000 Okay. Thank That'd you. mean we couldn't negotiate really hard at Thanksgiving <coughs> once he sees that we're going on the other site. Because then reality sets in and goes, oh, my God, I blew it. Okay. I'm really intrigued by the lease-to-own option on the duplexes. <laughs> and for what it's worth, I do use the term duplex. I'm a All property right. manager. Um, terms on that. Have we talked about that at all? And So we've got some financing available for 20-year. Okay. But I'm tr what I'm really, my goal is to drive down that monthly payment. So there is a FHA HUD program. I might be able to get 30 year. But to be honest, when we had our Zoom call, before we had the Zoom call with staff, I thought it had to be 500 apartments. So then when staff said, hey, we've got this company and they want some small lot single family homes, and then we might want some town homes. And so that's when we shifted. And so I, I haven't gone to HUD yet to say, hey, what kind of financing? But my goal is to get 30 year financing. Um, so I can drive that payment down as low well as possible. And I'm going to circle back to those first-time home buyer incentives. Uh, any expectation or any knowledge that it's going to expire anytime soon? Because I know time's always a factor on everything. So the legislature could always cut the funding, but if you and I've got legislation pending, so I'm up in Topeka all the time. But if you read what's going on, we've got like a billion dollar surplus. And so I don't see the legislature cutting current funding because we've got a billion dollar surplus. Now next year, if we had a billion dollar deficit, the, the program could get cut. But no, I don't see it with a billion dollar surplus. And the Senate passed, the Kansas Senate passed all kinds of tax cuts. I don't see them cutting programs while they're lowering taxes at the same time. Just personal observation. Understood. And I'm going to assume that the single family residential and the duplexes are going to be on slab foundation. Uh, it's only $8,000 more to put in a basement. Now, that would be a partial basement. So part of that's a city call. OK, if the city said, we want that slab on grades okay? Okay. If city said we want partial basements, we want full basements. Um, we've done we've done both. Now it it adds eight thousand dollars to the cost for a partial basement. But to be the flip side is in the other single family I've done, you have to have a tornado room. Tornado rooms, $3,500 to $4,000. So I don't want to mislead you. Yeah, partial basement's eight, but you don't have to put in the tornado room if you do the partial basement. So maybe the net is four, four and a half. It's been my experience. Any basement is going to make a property a lot more marketable. But that's just my experience. Some cities require basements, some cities don't. Yeah. Okay, I'm still uh, trying to digest all the numbers, but I, I, I like the idea of the mixed options. Uh, really good, because I think when you have new folks moving in, some are going to, I'm assuming a lot of these folks are bringing kids with them, and they just want the space, even if it's a small lot, you know, place to leave a tricycle or balls and stuff. On the size of the one bedrooms, uh, the 528 square feet, and I think, was that just at the Ambassador 
location because it just seemed kind of a small size for the, that many of the units. I'm, I'm, So for the one bedroom apartment size, yep. yeah, those are 528 at both either side. So for the apartments. Okay, is that, yeah, I haven't bought an apartment or rented an apartment in a long time, but it, there are hotel rooms that are bigger than that. I mean, is, is, is that the going size for it's an apartment in this part of the country? They're probably a little bit smaller than what you would see in some areas but it helps kind of keep those costs down over the you know over the project in total to keep the rent rates where we need them to be right and and, and our goal sir was mm -hmm. one of the challenges city staff presented to us <coughs> come up with as low rents as you could so that's why you see the rent numbers we have if you said hey that isn't a goal anymore we could revise this to mm -hmm. make the units bigger and charge more rent Yep. But one of the challenges was get the rents as low as you can, and so that was how we came up with a direction of city staff to get the rents as low as we could. Okay, and was the thought that the mix, if it was all apartments, half and half, <laughs> one of, half well, two actually, bedrooms, half one bedrooms. Be okay. The, the two bedrooms, are they one bath or two bath? Uh, uh, two, I believe. Right, Lucas? Yeah. Two bedroom, two bath. Okay, could have just said two bath. Thank you. Okay. Was it felt that that mix of units would be appropriate for what you envision Salina needing as far as the demographics of the new workers That's what moving. the study said. Okay. We did the study in January. I, I started the study in December when I first heard about the project. Mm -hmm. And so when the study came out, I had a draft before January 10th, but the final study was done January 10th. And that's what the study recommended. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Yeah. On the, uh, you say first units available in 311 at 24, and, and then I think it says 25 in another place. How quickly will those come online towards the finish date of uh, December of 2024? <laughs> when are you going to deliver the first units know. people can move into the so Magnolia site? So we would be looking at the first units coming online. Can I grab my notes real sure. quick? All right. <laughs> I want you to know that my lawyers are proud of me because I made it under the timeline. I had three minutes and 30 seconds left. I was <laughs> sure I was going to go. So about 16 months, we'd have the first 75 apartment units coming online. 17 months from Today. 7 of 23, is that? I'm just trying to look at whether there's there's this 25 going to be available. Are they going to roll out in kind of equal increments month by month, pretty, or pretty close? They all come online at the end. No, no, no. So we'll we'll phase them coming online. You'll you'll see an average of about 24 to 26 units per month coming online. Thanks. That's about that's the same. Either one of these. Uh, uh, well, the Magnolia Ambassador, when I am uh, agree with you, I'm not too keen on that, but the timeline for the construction is kind of the same for both? Um, a little bit. So Ambassador would lag about four months overall due to the abatement and demolition. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. Um, I noticed at one point we talked about the 366 units um, and then you had the duplexes and then you did the 250, 250 and then the mixed use. The, the million dollars from the city could be used on these, but the million from the county has to be infill, I believe. And I, this, these would, that million from the county would not work for the Magnolia property, is that correct? It, the million from the county is available in low to moderate income census tracts, and right. so, 
The Magnolia site is not in an LMI track. And so if we forego that million, we forego that million. Okay. Again, it was in there because I didn't know if you're going to mandate right. the, the hotel site. Um, could we talk a little bit, and again, I think your construction guy is going to have to come up here, uh, talk a little bit about the construction of the apartments as far as the finishes, and that may have been in there, and we've kind of gone through that real quick. Uh, sure. The uh, the type of uh, cabinets, um, uh, countertops, um, insulation, those type of things. If we could talk a little bit about the construction of it, the, the exterior product also. Sure. So we'll have, as you kind of saw in the um, 3D rendering that we did, we've got a mix of stone, hardy board siding on the exterior. We have uh, exterior stairs walking up to the building. Those will all be out of treks along with the uh, wood landings and, and patios outside each unit. On the inside, it'll be a fairly typical Class A finish out with LVT flooring, solid surface countertops, um, wood cabinets. So the, nothing you know there shouldn't be any surprises i mean it, it will be a class a unit okay so the uh, the cabinets are are not pressed board or whatever yeah. good okay that's one of the questions um what type of insulation do you use between the apartments as for sound soundproofing so how do you do that it, and similar to what's pretty typical uh, in the industry it'll be a double framed wall with uh, two bats of insulation between it and RC channel. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm catching up on terms. That's twice I've heard double frame, so I'm, <laughs> I'm already getting a little smarter. Yeah. Um, did we talk any, was there any mention in here about carports or garages that would be available? I think it said so many garages per. We do. We have 60, I believe it's 65 garages per 250 units. 65 garages. And what do those approximately run per month to, to rent out? Just. I don't know if we've that. gotten that far because there's another option. I don't want to, my lawyers say sometimes I get too complicated. But if there's no prohibition against solar in Salina, and believe it or not, there's prohibition against solar in some Kansas cities, okay? But if there's no prohibition against solar, the federal government under the Inflation Reduction Act doubled the tax credit available for solar. And so, again, depending on if the city will let me, you can build elevated solar over your parking lot, collect the solar energy, but what it ends up doing is creating, covering essentially all of the parking lot. But I didn't know this till I started in Garden City. Garden City's got prohibition against solar. So you can't do solar in Garden City. You can, but the penalty offsets 100% of the tax credit. Okay, and so I'm not far enough along in Salina to know if you have any penalties against solar, but there are, there are huge penalties in Garden City for solar. Energy. I'll look to staff real quick. Do we have any? Okay, so now we don't believe we have any penalties so, from staff. So well, how would you explain to, to me what that would do? Solar okay. and create a lot more carports, and then you wouldn't charge for the carports if we did solar. But um, you know, it's they're just I think four by four or six by six metal posts. They go up ten feet in the air. There's solar panels on top. Actually, there's solar panels on both sides, top and the bottom and they get the sun reflection off the parking lot, collects uh, solar energy on the bottom as well. And so um, the tax credit used to be, I think it was 25% uh, and now it's 50%. And it makes solar work. I'm an investor in a solar company, if you can't tell. Um, <laughs> it makes solar work basically anywhere in Kansas. I have seen this done in Arizona, uh, grocery store, say like a Dillon's. Uh, half of the parking lot was done, and the other half was under construction. and And I thought that's a great idea. 
uh, you know, the Arizona heat and sun, you got shade all the time. But the, where, and, and in Kansas, you know, it protects you from snow, from rain. It's still windy, I mean, but, uh, and you collect the energy. Where would the energy go? Into the apartments. You, now, depending on the efficiency of the units, I've told you everything I know about solar, okay? But depending about the efficiency of the solar, you might be able to drastically reduce the electric bill uh, for each unit. Drastically reduce the electric so, bill. So that would be at no cost to the residents? So there will be a bill. There, I don't have the numbers worked out yet, but let's say that it costs a million dollars to do the solar and the tax credits are $500,000. There's $500,000 still a cost, but instead of paying $100 a month for your electricity, you might have to pay $50 a month for your electricity uh, because of the solar. But it's all because of these increased tax credits. Now, to go back to, will the funding change on the first time home buyers? Hey, they could repeal solar tax credits next year. Okay, but right now, we're doing $100 million worth of solar panels over parking lots. And so, you know, as fast as we could move, we could, we could get that to work here. And that is, you are an investor in the solar company? Yes, sir. Doing this? Yes, sir. Full disclosure there. Because I have had this idea over here across the street at the stage it's on blacktop and it's scorching hot in the summer I had that idea to do a solar installation over there for shade yeah now it it works um, as far as going out for bid um, do you ha do you have your own subs being from Wichita or do you put that out for bid where local subs would also be able to we would do both, but we always prefer to use local folks as much as we can. Um, and, I mean, we know quite a few of the contractors here in Salina, so it would, it would be somewhat of a regional draw, but we would certainly prefer, especially on mechanical, electrical, plumbing, drywall, concrete, earthwork, to go local. Okay. And you do have an option on on both pieces of property you've discussed yes. then so when we okay and i'm going to look at staff a little bit because this is different than what i'm a little bit like commissioner Longby when we talk about you know apartments versus duplexes versus you know single family because we've already done the rhids with with two developers that are doing duplexes and single family so i guess my question to you is kind of how that went, the RFP went out, the, or the discussions with them that changed this from being total apartments to something else, even yeah. though they did mention they could do 500 apartments if we, if we right. wish. I think the, the RFP was directed at our, our market rate rental multifamily, and so as part of the interview conversation, this got offered up as an alternative to that. The In terms of townhome duplex compared to other things in the market we were really focused on price point rental rates square footages whether that was an apartment complex or some alternate project uh, product on the site but our focus was multifamily rentals primarily the uh, you, the study you had we have is took into account we do have um, Southview Estates that's doing single-family duplexes with RHID, and then we've approved another one, the aeroplanes. Did it take both of those properties into consideration? Mayor, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. Okay. Because I believe the aeroplanes is a fairly significant uh, number of units, and I don't have that off the top of my head. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to the sale versus rental um, right. question, and so uh, I'm repeating myself, but this uh, our focus was oh. with the rental side okay. of things. And the size of the duplexes, do you have the the size that those duplexes would be? In our, and I, I did see something on the back that shows single, that's a single family option, I believe that's a three bed, two bath. So what would the duplexes look like as far as square footage, bedrooms? Josh can answer that. 
Gosh, you're letting UMB off the hook. You're not asking him any questions. In the, the context. I know him. I'm not sure he has any answers. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. I was kidding. <laughs> Tough crowd. Um, yeah. So on the okay. So on the uh, the two bed we were or the uh, two story duplexes we were at 1,300 square feet. Or, I'm sorry, 1,300 square feet for the ranch style, 1,700 square feet for two-story. And were those two-bedroom, two-bath? What were those? Joe, were those three bed? Okay, so two-bed two per ranch style. Two-bed, two-bath? Yeah. Okay. And three bedroom for the three, three bedroom story. on the two story, <clears throat> and two bath on those in uh, two and a half, two, two and a half. half. And what were the rents on those? Was that in here? Did I? Got... Slide eight. There it is. That's I guess. So it's thirteen hundred to fourteen hundred dollars a month per unit. There we go. Okay. Yeah, we jumped over that, so I apologize for missing that. So, okay. Um, I, again, as we did last time, I'll uh, ask city staff if they have any questions. Um, you made the point that you hold, you don't flip, um, and one of the one of the discussion points uh, that we identified was development fee return on investment can you speak to your fees and so you know, how that fits into we the don't model? charge a development fee that just raises the amount of money you got to borrow so we don't we don't charge a development fee <clears throat> and then um you know the goal would be to get to a 10 cap on the on the apartments um it's hard to when you build something and you sell it to, to a first-time home buyer, I don't know what the cap rate's going to be on that because you don't own it that long. And so if my hope would be we could build some models, and if, if there was a pent-up demand, like Todd thought if I brought in the right price point, we might be able to pre-sell these. And so then you know i don't know how do you how do you calculate something you own 30 days um so that, that's a little harder but uh our goal would be on the apartments that we're going to hold for 100 years uh would be at a 10 cap on the apartments so how dependent is your model on the first time home buyer versus uh, no we, we according i called valbridge the people who did the study and they said if you're doing these townhomes uh, slash duplexes it opens up a whole nother market and with all the jobs that they saw coming into Salina they thought there were a lot of people that would rather live in a duplex that wouldn't want to live even if even if similar finishes they just want to live in a duplex as opposed to an apartment so he says it's all it's a different market so your absorption rate is twice as high Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rick, um, are there any particular challenges you, you see uh, to, to moving forward with the project in Salina, um, or or is, is, does, does this feel like once the the city makes um, their feelings known about the particular elements, it, it would go pretty quickly? So, so long as I don't have to do the hotel site, I don't see any challenges. But if I have to do the hotel site, I think the owner is going to be a pain. You know, and, and again, I don't think there's any rationale for him to get reasonable until we start on the Magnolia site and then reality hits in and collectively we would figure out what the pain threshold is. But at two million seven plus a million seven to tear down, you're at four million four. Other than that, that's that's the only challenge I see with this. And, and just to clarify, and I think we've talked about this before, but the, the funds available from the city were not dedicated to purchase price. They were, right. you know, just available to try to facilitate redevelopment. Right. So uh, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was in the paper. He told me. <laughs> right. Right. 
don't believe everything you read, Craig. Um, uh, I want to throw it open to the rest of the staff. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I did have a, another one. Uh, you talked about developments in Wichita. I, I'm down there on North Ridge Road frequently, and I see a lot of apartment construction. Can you give me some of your sites that you've developed? Josh? So the one that you're <coughs> under construction? That have been developed or that are currently under construction? Mm, yeah, so right now, we're building this exact model uh, of apartment with a little bit, um, Salina will have a little bit upgraded exterior finishes, but we're building this exact footprint with the same architectural design and engineering at K96 and 127th Street East. So uh, that's that's the one I. Yeah. What, what's it called? Uh, the verandas. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we we have very very good cost data uh, and constructability data on this exact program okay and we're gonna build pretty much the exact same thing in Derby and I will probably be down there Saturday so oh great yeah um, commissioners one thing that you asked about previously that I don't think was covered and Lauren reminded me is amenities um, you talked about exterior finishes and construction but could it's you on one of the slides yeah, it's on one of the slides okay. that's why I didn't that but let's if you want to do it yeah if you could tell what those amenities are probably for the public that's a good point I uh, I did see pickleball and uh, yeah for the, the site amenities for the overall development we've got pickleball basketball courts uh, we have clubhouse you know available for the community members to use uh, play children's playground um, you know I think we talked about doing a dog park as well barbecue Rick for, for those folks the barbecue area so you know the the typical amenities that you would expect at a class so it would be the complex. those same amenities be there if it was 250 versus 500 units you'd put it yes sir. At, okay is there a pool we don't have a pool in there in the design at the moment and again, so don't laugh, in Hayes, you're prohibited from doing a swimming pool. And you're prohibited from watering the plants. So, you know, there are landmines out there. Can't do solar. Can't do a pool. I got a water issue in Hayes. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm just saying, you know, you work with the city on what the city requires. So your solar parking is that just a grand idea or is that a no, reality? I, if it would it would cash flow. Now we've got to get in what your franchise agreement says with whoever your electric supplier is, because where it bit me in Garden City was the city didn't necessarily pass the ordinance. It was in their agreement with their electric provider that if you provide solar, it hurts their capacity. And because you hurt their capacity, there's this calculated penalty. And so the city basically passed an ordinance that said, any penalty that you cause to our electric supplier, you eat. Hmm. Bottom line is, can't do solar. And I mean, you can, but it doesn't make any sense. I think wind rules the day out there. I, I don't know. I just was shocked. Because we're going to do, um, uh, in Garden City, Garden City Community College, we're looking at doing some student housing. And we're going to do the solar to cover the parking lot student housing. Nope. Hmm. I, I just saw on the news yesterday the proposed solar development uh, up there northwest of your development there mm -hmm. off 135th, I think. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So we touched on um, your approach to soliciting subs, but knowing the labor market the way it is, what yeah. what's your assessment of availability and your access to contractors and subcontractors? Yeah, I mean it is a challenge industry wide right now. Kansas is is certainly not as bad as some of the other markets we work in, but we work about 32 states, so we have a pretty big network to be able to. Uh, 
bring in some travelers if we need to in the event that the local market can't you know can't sustain it but also by phasing the construction of these projects we don't necessarily have to have you know one concrete guy that can come in so you did you said okay we want 500 apartments you know it's roughly you know 10 buildings he doesn't have to be able to handle 10 buildings you know we can break that up between a couple of different contractors if we need to 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 supplement that labor force so have you identified any other alternate sites besides magnolia and the ambassador so, yes so todd todd has shown me now i've got magnolia under contract but todd has shown me two or three other sites that he said we could put under contract if we wanted to expand if we wanted to do more say single family and we needed more land so there's more land adjacent to the magnolia site and then there's some other land I apologize I don't remember the address just outside the city limits that would have to annex that there's another 15 20 acres available there um, and so yeah land really wasn't a, a major concern but Magnolia's we could move fairly quickly and I've had Josh do all the preliminary engineering stuff hey how soon can we go because I needed a timetable to give to the city I guess since you brought your banker along, I'd ask that <laughs> that uh, you've been approved for which whether you do 250, 250, 250 plus the duplexes, they've approved all that. Your your financing's approved. So, Whichever way you would be asked to to go. Yes and no. So we don't have a site, so he can't take it in for final approval to have a site. And <laughs> as an example, if we do 250. Or, or 300 apartments and 100 duplexes, which is 200 units. He's got to go in with those numbers as opposed to, I, I, gosh, I think the city manager or city staff said you've got a Japanese company where they wanted some single family, small lot single family. So we haven't gotten into with the city yet. Do you think you need 50 small lot single family? Do you think you need 30 small lot single family? But they solicit Dave all the time, please bring us business, please bring us business. We're not worried about financing. And Steve volunteered to come to say, to answer any questions you've got, that he thinks this is financeable. I guess he says yes, or he would be sitting in the audience probably. It'd be a little embarrassing, so I'm guessing he's supportive, so. Just saying that as an ex-banker, so just, okay. Any other questions from staff? I think I think that answered everything I had. So okay. thank you guys for thank being you. with us. And I believe we will have a break. Looks like we have an hour. Our next one is scheduled for 12 noon, correct? It is. Uh, we will be delivering lunch into the room. The schedule was 11.30. I don't know if they'll be here any earlier, but then the next scheduled interview is noon. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.